Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of September 21st. I'm your City Council President Bill Dwight, and I'll be presiding tonight. As is our usual custom, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the public comment section before we actually convene. You can't hear me? Oh, no. oh God. <laughs> uh, Jen, can you, can you amp up the mic in the back by any chance? Okay, and I'll, I'll speak more blusterily. How's that? Um, so what we do is th we have a public comment section that precedes the council meeting before we convene officially. And that is an opportunity for you to speak and to speak to us. As such, since we're not assembled under the, under the rules of the council, we're not allowed to speak, which is probably best, given the fact that we'll, we're going to be talking probably till 1 o'clock this morning, so and spare you with that. So what, there are some guidelines. Because of time constraints, we ask that you keep your comments under three minutes. And you're not obliged to talk for three minutes if you feel that you can sum up everything in less time. Um, the other thing is when, you, when you, I call your name, please step up, repeat your name, correct my pronunciation, and then tell us what your address is, and that's for the public record. Um, yeah, ironically, I'm going to make this statement for the purposes of this meeting and also for public documentation. This meeting is recorded <laughs> uh, in video and audio. And also, I ask that you respect the decorum of the chamber. And in so doing, that is to refrain from uh, speaking about a person who's not a public person. We're elected officials. You are allowed to say or anything you want about us or s call us any particular name as long as it doesn't qualify as obscene and uh, but other if your neighbor annoys you don't mention your neighbor by name you can say my neighbor annoys me but don't mention your neighbor by name and in, in this context also given that there are a lot of people queued up to speak I would also ask to uh, refrain from uh, demonstrably applauding booing hissing or anything else that's dramatic for reinforcement and then one other request that I would make of you, although it's not required, is if you heard someone say something that you agree with, say ditto, and then come up and then speak to an original point, something that you, you, you don't think has been shared that you might be able to share with us. And that's just for <laughs> to expedite things, but again, that's not a rule, and I won't rule you out of order if you are repeating something that's already said. It's just a consideration, please. If you run over the three minutes, I will ask you to stop if you insist, then I will, uh, under the council rules, we will go into immediate recess, the camera will shut off, and then we will uh, stop and wait until you, you've said what you're going to say. But I prefer that um, you respect the context that we're asking you to, you're speaking to the council, and if you're speaking to the public in general, it won't be recorded, so it, the tree will be falling in the woods and no one will hear it. All right, I think that covers it. So, to start, we have Sam Harper. Top, topper. Yeah. Topper, Happy yeah, I'm sorry. Sam. I No, I'm sorry, Sam. <laughs> okay. Happy birthday, Sam. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Sam Hopper. I live at 257 South Street in Northampton. I have a six-year-old who goes to Bridge Street School here in Northampton. She rides the school bus every school day, and she has many friends in her age group that do the same thing. Uh, today was the 15th day of school, and just at our one school bus stop on South Street, eight cars have gone through illegally passing our bus in those 15 days. Um, it's, high, it's far too many. I understand that my observations are not a statistically representative sample of all of Northampton, but I also know that our stop is not an outlier. Um, yesterday afternoon, a second grade child was hit by a car here in Northampton a car that illegally passed her stopped school bus. She's okay, thankfully. Um, she walked away with scrapes and bruises. But this is a serious problem, and I was hoping we wouldn't have to wait until something like this happened to do something, but to me this should be a huge wake-up call to everyone. I am so sick of watching people abuse their privilege of driving. People drive too fast, people are on their phones, they're distracted, they're oblivious of what's going on, and there are severe consequences. Um, 
I'm here tonight to bring awareness to this issue. I'm hoping that people will hear this and think twice or remind their friend who's on their phone, hey, put that down, pay attention, or maybe take a second to look at what the law is around school buses. Not even ambulances can pass a stop school bus with the stop sign out and the red lights on. And this is a law in all 50 states. This isn't new. Everyone who drives should know this. I'm also here to ask for help. Um, if anyone here has suggestions, I am open to it. Uh, I've been working with some counselors who have been really helpful and supportive. Um, the police chief has been very supportive, but we just need to do more to bring awareness to this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Henry Heafy, please. Good evening. I'm Henry Heafy from Washington Avenue, and I'm here to talk about the camera situation. I would first like to make a quote, or recite a quote that was in Mass Live. It says, quote, the burden of proof is on the police department and the mayor to prove that there is a need, and just no need has been demonstrated. And what I want to make clear is that at the meeting at the senior center a while ago, a couple of weeks ago, Chief Casper did say that her presentation was preliminary. There was still information to be gathered from the towns of Amherst and Belchertown and East Hampton. Um, she went through a series of statistics on crime. Um, there is no budget for this yet, so it's very preliminary. That was her presentation. And I guess I was also struck by the fact that when you read the police department online listing of crimes in town, crimes are at an all, police action is at an all time high. In the last three years, the arrests for heroin and narcin uh, nars have tripled. The larceny arrests are up. And what's also interesting is that the population of Northampton is actually lower now than it was in 2009. So the population has not gone up, and the crime hasn't gone up for it, but crime has gone up, and the population has essentially stabilized or you know, gone down by 1,000 people, which is not a great deal, but it's stabilized. I also think that the, that the second point that I'd like to make is that there was a good deal of talk about the intrusion of, of cameras on Main Street, if this does go through, but I think we have to realize <coughs> that cameras, as she said, are in the garage, they're on Center Street, they're used by the police in specific instances, such as the sex trafficking crime problem that Northampton had, um, and it's also used on first night or other major events. The, therefore, I think if there is an, an outcry or, or a problem with people having cameras on Main Street, then why aren't we thinking <coughs> about the similar sort of reaction for the garage or wherever? I think also stores, <coughs> cameras. The police department and the police chief said those recordings would be kept for 21 days. We don't know how long stores keep theirs. We don't know that we know the quality can vary a good deal. As a matter of fact, I did ask the manager of a local store just this last week, what would you do if ICE came in and said, let's have your video? I don't know. That was his answer. I asked a store owner, what would you do? His answer was, I asked for And the police chief has said, you don't, ICE doesn't even need a subpoena to get any recording that this police department takes. So therefore, okay. thank you, sir, therefore, I really think we should have an advisory committee to look at the statistics and the facts that we collect. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Flaherty, please. <laughs> Counselors, protesters, Monsignor Dwight, uh, I come here tonight to talk about the Pongathon. And, uh, and by the way, the first. Uh, Cops, can I interview, uh, interrupt you for a second, yeah. and you're going to have to state your address and your name, please. My address? Uh, well, temporarily 15 Hampton Avenue, Northampton, Mass. Okay. My actual address is 9 Oak Avenue. South Hadley. South Hadley. Right. Um, uh, first, the counselor who laughs at my shorts, by the way, I'm going to see that you get voted out of office. But uh, um, 
I've been thinking about the refugees lately. There's several refugees who have come here to Northampton from hell holes uh, across the seas. Uh, I specifically have been thinking lately about uh, two young brothers, uh, Garleen and Olivier, uh, who spent 14 years in a hell hole, a uh, camp, refugee camp of Burundi. Um, and then I think about the dedicated souls who brought them here, the people from Catholic Charities, uh, people from the Welcome Home Committee, uh, Councillor Klein can talk all about that, and the incredible work that the Circle of Care does. And I have a lot of pride that this is the America that these people are going to know, the America of King Street and the Oxbow and Hospital Hill. This is the America that these two brothers are going to experience. This is the America they're going to live in, not the one on TV with the guns and all the hate. Um, but then I think about the parents of these two kids. The parents, they can't get out. They're back in Burundi. There are four younger siblings. One of them is on their way, but there are four younger siblings who may never get out, and especially with the freezes now. They may never see their, their brothers and sisters again. So that gets me a little bit pissed. Now, as a talk show host, what I would usually do to approach an issue like this is I would do what I do almost, you know, every other week. I would write a song about deporting Donald Trump. That's, you know, basically what I would do. But I figured that there's a better way. And I'm going to be doing a pongathon. I'm going to be playing ping pong for 12 straight hours. All right? 12 straight hours at Zing. Zing is this incredible ping pong place, tennis, uh, table tennis place in East Hampton, state of the art. Um, now, I understand that you guys can't talk back to me tonight, so I could basically berate you. So I uh, challenge you. I challenge the uh, challenge city council to come on October 6th, Friday, October 6th. I'm playing all day from 7 to 7 in East Hampton. Uh, you should come. Uh, uh, Councilor Nash, you should definitely play. You should come. Bring Crosby, Stills, and Young with you. Um, Councilor Murphy, you'll win an Emmy if you come and film this thing. I can guarantee you. Uh, Councilor Carney, you should bring your violin. I'll let you play with your violin <laughs> play, you know, instead, of the, instead of the ping pong paddle. The Senate President is going to be there. The Senate President was on crutches not long ago. Your old Mayor Claire Higgins is going to come up and play ping pong that day. It's 12 hours. It's nonstop. Uh, it's child's play. It's a half hour of your time. Some of your meetings seem like 12 hours, so this should be child's play for you, right? Um, anyway, and anybody, it's 50 bucks to challenge me, 50 bucks if you beat me. Our sponsors kick in another 50 bucks, Sylvester's and Cooper's Corner. Uh, so come out. If you don't have 50 bucks, bring 15 bucks, 15 bucks. You can just bring a friend. You can play all day. Come play. It's all for the Welcoming Refugees Fund, Catholic Charities. I'll leave these two things. See, that's me. That's me. It says right here. 12 hours. I love it. 12 hours. We, we just <laughs> came up on a hard break here, Bob. <laughs> we just came on a hard break. I thought I was going to hit the phone. <laughs> Thank, Thank you very God. much. Uh, John Riley, please. <clears throat> John Riley, uh, I live on 88 Turkey Hill Road. That's a tough act to follow. I feel like I'm uh, following Silas Kopf in a, uh, in a debate. Uh, I really want to commend the City Council for maintaining this forum, one of the few really democratic forums that we have in the city. I, tonight I'm speaking as a private citizen, as a downtown merchant for over 40 years, and as a recent candidate for mayor of Northampton. I want to address the plan to place surveillance cameras in the downtown area. Let me make it perfectly clear I am totally opposed to such an idea. When elected mayor, I will permanently defund any such scheme. I attended the meeting organized by Police Chief Casper, and I filmed the whole two hours for Northampton Community Television, where it can be seen in its entirety on Channel 15 and on the station's YouTube channel. I applaud our Chief of Police for being so open and accessible on this issue. This is part of what makes Northampton the unique place that it is. But I have to say that after hearing the presentation, I'm even more opposed to cameras downtown than I was when I first heard about this radical change in policing. I feel that the chief could not justify claims that cameras would make us safer and deter crime. We were initially told that cameras would only record images for the Northampton police and that tapes would be erased after three weeks. That turned out to be only partially true because federal and state agencies can obtain those images at any time. We were also told that no facial recognition software would be employed on those images, but then again, that proved false because federal and state agencies can apply state-of-the-art software on those stored images. Then we were told that Amherst, East Hampton, and Belchertown all employ surveillance cameras, but when asked whether they actually lower the crime rate, there were no facts or statistics to back up that claim. 
Northampton has experience at exerting our independence, just as we did when we declared ourselves a sanctuary city. The chief of police recognizes that fact and even applauds it. So banning cameras is only one more way Northampton can lead the way for other municipalities <coughs> in defending our freedom and independence. If elected mayor, I will not fund surveillance cameras in our town. I feel that they are contrary to everything we value in our city. Let's keep Northampton the welcoming, positive, unique place that it is. There is one person who can immediately stop this plan, and that is the mayor. I hope to accomplish that. Uh, thank you very much. And now Adele Franks, please. Good evening. My name is Adele Franks. I live on Black Birch Trail in Florence. And I just happened to be browsing through the city council meeting agenda today. And I noticed to my surprise that um, there were three ordinance changes uh, that would uh, facilitate the erection of uh, solar panels uh, in our city. And as someone who is passionately interested in reducing our reliance on burning fossil fuels, I would like to speak in favor of those three ordinance changes. That was 17-348, 17-349, and 17-350. And as long as I have the microphone while I'm here, I would also like to say that I am in favor of the, uh, strongly in favor of the ordinance opposing the installation of surveillance technology downtown. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, Ed Olmstead, please. Oh, I'm sorry, uh, Marty Nathan's next and then Ed Olmstead. I'm Marty Nathan, 24 Massasoit Street, and I will say ditto to Adele, um, but I'll exp explain a little bit more. I'm here tonight to support the three proposed ordinances that will encourage and facilitate the city's um, adoption of solar energy in our struggle as a community for sustainability against the threat of climate change. I'd also like to insert myself that I am support in support of the, res, uh, the ordinance to oppose the surveillance cameras, but that wasn't why I was here particularly. Um, back to my main purpose, I support the adoption of August, uh, Ordinance 17348 to clarify parking lot de design criteria when installing photovoltaic canopies over surface parking lots. That's hard to say. This clarifies that planting strips and trees are not necessary for parking spaces that have solar canopies, thus encouraging solar development over these heat islands. Ordinance uh, 17349 would allow small-scale ground-mounted photovoltaic arrays in the floodplain, which clarifies the conditions and, and clears the way for mounting solar arrays in unused flood, floodplain agricultural land. I would ask that here that it be ensured that land designated for such not be forested the, so that trees are not cut down in order to put up the solar arrays. Uh, 17350 changes the site plan section 350s to require new construction of a certain size to be solar ready. This is an excellent, exciting ordinance and allows that Northampton is, uh, and shows that Northampton is looking forward to the new renewable economy by ensuring that all new buildings have or be ready for rooftop solar. We're facing a climate emergency and must cut fossil fuel emissions as soon as humanly possible through conservation and by substituting renewable energy such as solar and wind. Providing community source, sourced solar is a critical means of doing that and these ordinances are small but important steps in that direction. I asked the council after making the one cl clarification about the trees that uh, to be thought about, pass these ordinances tonight unanimously. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, now Ed Olmstead. Uh, my name is Ed Olmstead. I live at 43 Stilson Avenue in Florence. Um, 
I'm here to make some comments about the, the proposal by uh, Police Chief Jody <coughs> Casper for security cameras downtown. Uh, but I'm sorry I didn't realize that the solar panel ordinance was, uh, uh, re resolutions are on the table as well. I would like to encourage the, the council to move it forward as quickly as possible on solar. Um, I would like it also to say that solar incompatibility with whatever habitat they're being <coughs> placed in. And I didn't familiarize myself with those ordinances, so I can't speak directly to that. Um, I am concerned about the security cameras as being considered during a time when there's a rise in hate crimes and some prominent officials of federal government are failing to take steps to decrease this unhealthy behavior. <coughs> It's beyond disturbing to me that our president vigorously denigrates and vilifies whom he pleases without regard to the truth or facts. I'm therefore concerned that security cameras and the information they collect are going to be sought by such government officials, by hackers, by commercial entities, and other unscrupulous individuals. I'm also concerned that there are not the same safeguards in Massachusetts laws for video recording as there is for audio recording and sharing. That being said, I believe a thoughtful consideration of this matter is important for the city. I appreciate Chief Casper's seeking of input into this proposal and seeking responses from residents. She is right to say that cameras are already here. It's not a matter of whether we have them or not. It's whether the police force uses them. And I think that given that these, the <laughs> technology is going to be increasing in all kinds of spheres, not only cameras, but drones, uh, robots, other kinds of things, that it's important to tackle this and open up this discussion and consider what we want for privacy, what we want people looking at. I think having cameras on, on Main Street and uh, randomly videotaping everybody is not a, a <coughs> wise thing to do, and I'm glad that she suggested something as an alternative However, I believe that these cameras being, if they're owned by the police station, uh, police department, and they are publicly <coughs> in the record, that their, their contents might be used by those who are not serving our best interest. And unfortunately, I think those include some people who are elected officials, especially at the federal level. I am not one who sends out my fingerprints, photos, videos, and other personal information are on Apple and Google to store and manage as some of us do. Um, I do value having some privacy and I think that it's important <laughs> that we all have privacy in this country. Thank you. Thank you very much. <coughs> Amy Bookbinder, please. <coughs> Amy Bookbinder, Grove Avenue in Leeds. We've recently shared many proud moments in our city, from putting a Black Lives Matter flag up on our city hall, to declaring Northampton a sanctuary city, to hiring a woman for our police chief. Proud moments. So tonight I say, what happened? I was told the flag came down because Martin Luther King's birthday month ended. Do Black Lives Matter only in January? Before he became everybody's favorite hero, Martin Luther King was the despised victim of COINTELPRO under surveillance to silence him in his dissent. So tonight I say put that flag back up. Since we became a sanctuary city, we were told our immigrants could feel safe, be safe from harassment and possible detention and deport deportation by our officers complying with ICE. But since then, information about an immigrant arrested for a minor offense was given by our police to ICE. So tonight I say, why did that happen? Now our police department wants more surveillance cameras. And I was appalled to learn at the forum that protest rallies and marches in our city have already been videotaped by our police. So tonight I say, who has those tapes? Who's had access to them and who still does? The FBI, ICE, who? Delete those tapes and stop taping our rallies and marches. Dissent is patriotic. Taping us is not in the spirit of our First Amendment rights or a sanctuary city. Since our police chief received deserved praise 
for supporting transparency in police data on incidents and police actions taken, I've learned that the breakdown by race includes whites and Hispanics only. Blacks are excluded from this data. So I say tonight, if the police think black lives matter, include them in your data. Why more surveillance cameras now? Does the timing have anything to do with our police officers' recent training in Arpaios, Arizona? Why were they sent to the state known for law and order racial profiling of the worst kind? Does it have anything to do with several recent protests here with 200 to 500 people marching for the rights of low-wage workers, refugees, immigrants, and others already under threat, joining together in large numbers to stand up against intimidation and speaking truth to power? We heard at the forum that cameras may help police solve crimes, but not necessarily prevent them. We heard that there may be no way to prevent state or federal agencies from accessing surveillance camera tapes, including the FBI and ICE. So I ask this final question tonight. Why? Why now? Are we a sanctuary? Can I just finish? Are we a sanctuary city or not? Do black and brown lives and the lives of our homeless matter here or not? Do the privacy rights of citizens and visitors matter? Final sentence. I supported Jody Casper's promotion to police chief, also a proud moment in our city. We don't want Big Brother in Northampton, but we also don't want our sister, Jody to become Big Sister. Jody, we need you to withdraw the plan. Counselors, thank you for opposing them. If not now, in these Orwellian, Trumpian times, when? There was a couple, there was a little more than one more sentence, Amy, but you're, you got it. Uh, Jim Nolan, please. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the council, I am Jim Nolan. I live at 79 Clement Street, Florence, and I have a slight problem with a shade tree that is no longer a shade tree. The city has stripped it, cut it all up. It's a city tree. I'm trying to get it to the city to cut it down and they refuse, the tree warden. Um, but they can cut five trees down up here at uh, Ford <coughs> Library and say it's a public hazard. This tree is also a public hazard and it blows back and forth. When it comes down, it's gonna destroy my house. Either we get killed or one, one of us get killed or both of us will get killed. This is how bad this tree is. It's over 40 feet high, and we just have a one-level house. And the, the tree warden just won't do it. He told me that if I wanted to pay to have advertisement done in the newspaper, I could pay the 230 bucks. And they'll have a meeting, and if they agree and nobody objects to it, they'll take the tree down for me at my expense. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, Blair Jimma, is that, did I pronounce that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, I'm Blair Jimma. I live at 3 Clark Ave. And um, I just wanted to say that I'm opposed to posting cameras on Main Street. I think um, it's an invasive, aggressive attempt to uh, criminalize all of Northampton. And I'm glad that so many people have a problem with the surveillance of cameras. And I'd like to even uh, push that a little further. Um, when I attended um, the police chief's meeting and um, her re some of the reasons behind her wanting cameras here um, was to prevent terror and to stop theft. And um, I can't help but notice that there's this group of uh, people constantly driving um, up my street, Old South Street, up South Street, Main Street. Um, they're in these white SUVs. And they're always looking around, um, surveilling with their eyes. They have the best technology in the world. Um, from what I can see, they always have uh, three weapons strapped to their bodies. 
Um, one is deadly, one's meant to poison your eyes, the other is meant to beat you into submission. If you resist um, what they say they have seen, and so I would just say if the police chief wants to address terror, then to take into the account that the constant patrolling of a community is an act of terror. And as far as theft goes, I can't help but notice that every year my rent goes up $60 and nothing is done to improve my house. So I don't know what else you call that but theft. And if all of you think that having shelter as a human being is a right we should have, then we shouldn't have to pay rent and rent is theft. Thank you very much. Um, Lois Ahrens, please. <coughs> Lois Ahrens, I live at 5 Warfield Place. Um, I am against the surveillance cameras, and I'm going to speak about that, but I'm going to speak about <coughs> what I see about policing here in Northampton and what I see it be becoming. So I strongly oppose the 24-7 police surveillance proposed by Chief Casper. In a little over two years, it seems to me there's been a string of misguided at best or just plain wrong choices for Northampton. Some of the ones that come to mind are a police department open portal ostensibly to build trust and legitimacy which tracks arrests but not police stops, which is where evidence of racial profiling can be found. High Five Fridays, <clears throat> moving police into elementary schools, sending Northampton police to train in Arpaio's jail, where um, some of the uh, worst human rights abuses in any jail in, in this country have taken place, which is a dubious distinction given the competition of jails. Chief Casper and her department finding themselves not guilty of any wrongdoing and forcibly removing Eric Matlock from the uh, steps of City Halls. And a capital request by Casper for the purchase of riot shields. I regularly these days work in New York and see and hear fewer police cars with sirens blasting and lights whirling than I do any day in Northampton. And now we have the latest, a proposal where, if agreed to, we will be monitored and recorded by police in, on Main Street. This despite, despite the fact that every study of urban environments finds the best guarantee of public safety is when more people use public spaces, yeah. not more surveillance and not more police. I can't help but wonder what, this, what city Casper and the mayor think they are policing. What kind of police force does Northampton need uh, where the police are judge and jury of their own behavior? Um, where the police are accountable only to the mayor, it seems. Is this the kind of aggressive policing that residents want? Given the past two years, I think now is the time to create an independent police review board so residents of the city can assess and monitor the actions of the police and their plans for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Dana Goldblatt, please. Hi, my name is Dana Goldblatt, and I live at 140 William Street. And uh, as you can see, I'm here to support the measure to limit, sur to prevent surveillance uh, in downtown Northampton. Uh, I want to ditto everything everyone said who has, uh, who has spoken uh, in favor of this ordinance. And what I'd like to do is talk about how important I think it is and how grateful I am to the council for taking this up and for acting. Uh, I think most likely given the, uh, given the enormous pushback that there has been on this, that it's entirely likely that the police chief and the mayor will dial this back and this won't happen. Uh, I still think that this ordinance is incredibly important, and here's why. Uh, watching, I went to the meeting uh, where uh, Chief Casper spoke about why she felt this was important and what her understanding of her role in policing was, and it became very clear to me 
that uh, the police, even in a progressive community, are not trained in this community. And they bring, they, they're trained somewhere else. And they're trained in these very specific police values. And that part of what Chief Casper was trying to do was to proselytize these police values to Northampton. So she came to this meeting and she told us that we needed to be worried about terrorism. And she told us that we needed to be, uh, that there was a lot of public safety issues. And what she was doing was she was eliding uh, property crimes with safety crimes, so a lot of shoplifting. And she was calling it a public safety issue. Now, everyone's opposed to shoplifting, but that doesn't make it a public safety issue. This is not, this is not people getting assaulted. And so these kinds of, these kinds of maneuvers in the sense that I was being propagandized to by uh, a security force was distressing in Northampton. And I think it's part of a larger trend of where policing is going. Uh, I think it's part of a larger trend of what the police force tends to think its role is, which is to teach us how important policing is and to, and to convince us to surrender various liberties to them and to arm themselves more and more and more. Mm -hmm. That those are the three things that have been happening nationwide and Northampton is not exempt from this trend. There's no reason to think we would be. Our police train in the same places as all the other police. They train in the same statewide, statewide training facility. So they come to this with the same values, the same concerns, and I think it's gonna be, in the next few years, it's gonna be the burden of the legislative branch locally at the state level and at the federal level to rein this in. And that's gonna fall to you. And I'm incredibly grateful that you picked it up so fast, and I hope that you will continue on that, uh, to continue what you're doing, even if this particular one moment, there's a step back from the executive. That I hope this ordinance still passes, and I hope we send a strong message. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Suzanne Beck, please. Uh, my name is Suzanne Beck, and I'm here representing the Greater Northampton Chamber of Commerce at 99 Pleasant Street. I'd like to make a statement about the ordinance and the resolution that the council will act on tonight concerning uh, the surveillance cameras. My request to the council is to vote against the resolution and take whatever steps are necessary with the ordinance that it will allow time for more dialogue. Chief Casper, in her letter to the editor and her letter to the council, restates her department's rationale for surveillance in the same way that she has presented it in public, a methodical, evidence-based explanation to support the recommendation. To her credit, she also makes it very clear that the department is open to input and debate about the best approach for what's in, uh, what's in Northampton's best interests, and I think that's really important to consider. There are different viewpoints about the um, use of surveillance cameras. I attended a meeting in May with downtown business and property owners with the chief and heard their observations about what is happening in downtown, concerns about drug use and shoplifting, and they are essentially in an ideal position to see firsthand daily what is happening. They are also the victims of some of the crimes that are committed. So yes, I think their input and perspective is important to hear. But I don't think you're going to hear this point of view tonight from many, if any, business and property owners. I was happy to hear Hank um, and make his comment. <coughs> the resolution and ordinance send a clear message. That is, we've heard all we need to hear and we're closing the door on a well-considered recommendation for, by the police department and, and the opinions that may support the department's request. Both the resolution and the ordinance are at cross purposes with your role as a city council, in my opinion. Your role is to encourage public dialogue, to listen to all viewpoints, to reconcile these differences in a solution that is well informed and debated, and you're really good at this. I would argue that in the public space, it's your most important role, and the consequence of short-circuiting that role casts a pall that is chilling on the importance and necessity of debate. The local context is important. We are so fortunate to have Chief Casper. I'm happy to speak in defense of our department and her department in charge of our public safety. 
This department reflects the values of our community every day and conducts itself with the compassion and professionalism to represent those values. I honestly don't know how you could refuse the opportunity for further dialogue out of respect for the chief and our police department. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, David Cordette, please. <coughs> David Corbett, Fort Hill Terrace. They were reading the paper the other day, uh, September 20th, from the Associated Press. It says, one of the big breaks in the case came when a security camera noticed a car. That footage from the surveillance camera, according to the police chief, he feels confident that this killer would not have killed again. Would it, well, he would have killed again if not caught. Two black men shot to death down in Louisiana. Could that happen here? Possibly. You're going to close the door on the possibility of stopping further murders? Stupid. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Eric Matlock, please. Hi, uh, Eric Matlock, 14 Union Street. <clears throat> uh, I want to support the ordinance to prevent cameras being installed in downtown Northampton. Um, but first, I want to bring up what I see as the rampant criminalization of homeless people in this city. Northampton is one of the kindest cities I know. Yet almost every day, my wife or I experience either ourselves or someone in our community being treated disrespectfully by Northampton police. It seems clear that they're not here to protect all of us, but instead to further marginalize certain people. I want to ask that uh, complaint forms be made available in the lobby of the police station or in order to avoid the vetting process I experienced when I went there to file a complaint. And I, I believe a bunch of people probably experienced that. The, the police chief noted how she'd only received two complaints all year. That's, compl in a good police station, that's mm -hmm. absolutely unheard of. Um, I'd also ask someone to be sure the Iowa station in the police station be fixed because it didn't work when I last visited. Mm. Uh, I wanna ask that the police be, if they're gonna be funded for cameras, they'd be funded for body cameras that cannot be turned off by them or erased by them and whose footage is sent automatically and in control of a civilian or city council for review. I think the oversight would create more accountability and is a win-win for everyone, since the footage could also be used for police training, as well as better accounts of their interactions with witnesses or suspects during investigations. I know I'd feel a lot safer since it would make the police hesitate before employing force against anyone. I'm sure two black people could be killed in the city, probably by your police. And the city would be happy to have more honest officers and less risk of lawsuits. Um, I'd also ask that there be funding for better public relations training. Our police should be trained to be shields to the people, not swords. That is all. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to kill Misha Hyde, Marianne. Boy, you're going to you're going to you'll fix me, right? It's Misha, hi, Mariano. Uh, I live at 325 North Main Street in Florence, and I'm here also to speak um, in favor of the ordinance against surveillance cameras. Ditto to a lot of what people have said, so I'll keep it pretty short. Um, to kind of piggyback on the idea of uh, body cameras, I want to bring up an experience I had last year when I was um, witnessing a panel that Jody Casper was on. I think the panel was called something like Do Black Lives Matter in Northampton? Um, where she said that body cameras are, she's, she was against body cameras, um, said that the money wouldn't be worth it. And the main argument was that um, it would cause cops to hesitate before acting. And when, when pushed on that, um, even in the case that a police officer would be shooting a person, and even in the case 
of shooting a child um, like Tamir Rice. And so, yeah, I don't have um, any trust in the use of police here and um, with cameras or without cameras with or without cameras because really they can use cameras however they want to. They watch who they want to and they're going to um, continue doing that if they have no oversight because really who has oversight of the police here, um, which has been brought up earlier. But um, if it's just the police unions um, who have some kind of oversight, then that's bad news for the people of Northampton, and I'm here for the people of Northampton. Um, and so I think that community surveillance of police is a good idea, not saying cameras, um, but I think community oversight. And um, so let's not support any increased funding for equipment. Let's support um, the people to to have some kind of a say in what happens here and how we're policed. Thank you very much. Um, Gabe? Uh, my name is Gabe. Um, I live on Crescent Street in Northampton. Um, kind of want to ditto what everybody said. I'm also against the surveillance cameras. Um, and here are a few key points I took away from the meeting with Chief Casper last week. She said, we actually live in a super safe community. We could have caught the ukulele wielding citizen if we had cameras in the park. We already have cameras downtown. We already film lar large events such as Pride, First Night, and the Hot Chocolate Run. We can get copies of footage we need from private businesses. We cannot stop ICE, the FBI, or any other law enforcement agency from acquiring the footage should they ask for it. The community winnowed the need for cameras down from here, and many of us concluded from that meeting that the main purpose of the cameras was to deter people from shoplifting. And to me, that's a business owner issue. That said, I'm here to say that putting our minority populations more at risk with cameras on the streets is against my core values and the values of the city I grew up in. Our police department has grown from white sedans to SUVs to stealth SUVs to a fortress of a police station. The NPD, like most police departments in this country, is overfunded. And just to be clear on my message, let me draw a comparison for you. I chose to become a registered nurse. This means that on any given day, I can and have been kicked, punched, spit on, sworn at, and exposed to highly infectious airborne and bloodborne pathogens. I chose those risks. I also do not carry a gun, pepper spray, taser, or baton. In my profession, you take the good with the bad. I choose my job and business owners and police choose theirs. These occupations come with a certain amount of risk and that risk will be there no matter how much we try to stop it. What should not come with a certain amount of risk is being a minority and walking through our downtown. Thank you very much. So uh, that's all we have signed up. Um, does anyone else wish to speak at this moment? <laughs> how many hands do I have? One, two, three. Uh, Sharon, then you, and Josh, okay. My name is Sharon Moulton. I live in Ward 7B in Leeds, and I came both to speak in favor of the um, ordinances, making it easier and uh, clearer about adding photovoltaic, photovoltaic, uh, to the city and also I'm in favor of the uh, preventing more surveillance and the one thing that I have to say that's different <coughs> is that I'm really concerned that we're not talking to each other enough I would <coughs> way rather have police trained <coughs> to spend more time walking around, talking to people, that we need to get to know each other as people, that there's too much mm -hmm. us and them, and so th that's, that's the trend that I'd like to see us as progressive Northampton moving way far away from most anywhere else. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, in the back? My name is 
is Julia Cox. Uh, I've been a resident here since 2006, coming up for Smith. Um, I'm opposed to this for a few simple reasons. Excuse me, Julia, can, I, um, can you give us your address, please, too? Absolutely. It's 47 Summer Street, Thanks. Apartment D. Um, first, I think that it is um, just really inappropriate for public tax dollars to be funding private businesses' security. Um, if they want to make their businesses more safe, they should do so themselves. Um, second, I think that it gives, there's just not enough uh, regulation on it. Um, the implications for other uh, members of our community is just the risk is far beyond the reward. Um, and finally, I am proof that the police are uh, not always fair in this town. Uh, five years ago, they came into my apartment um, and uh, <laughs> put me in handcuffs, threw me down two flights of stairs, um, put me in the hospital for a few days. Um, I was drunk, but still, they should be trained to deal with drunk people. Um, and it just, there needs to be more oversight, more regulation. Uh, if it was a more cohesive plan from beginning to end, uh, perhaps I would be more open to hearing about all the possibilities and the reasons why. But the reasons that they have put forth thus far uh, aren't adequate justification in my book. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, so it was Josh, yes. Jeffrey Miller, 99 Pines Edge Drive, Northampton, Massachusetts. And I also own uh, Cosmic Cab you know, here in Northampton, Massachusetts, located 160 Main Street. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank the council and the community at large for the opportunity to serve Northampton's transportation needs for the past five and a half years. We have grown from one cab and one driver to seven cabs and nine drivers and are currently the only fully licensed insured taxi company registered in Northampton. Although our growth has been steady, we have endured many setbacks. This is partially due to the lack of enforcement of some ordinances uh, pertaining to the taxi livery and vehicle for hire industry. Some companies going so far as to boldly advertise themselves as a taxi or cab while not carrying the proper insurance or licenses. One, one company even wrote a letter to this council explaining they could not afford the taxi re insurance requirements <laughs> and that operating a livery plate is a fraction of the cost of a taxi, in quotes. These companies currently operate taxis with livery plates. Upon meeting with Chief uh, Casper and Officer Allard in regards to these matters, it was decided the ordinances would be rewritten. Recently, the Committee on Legislative Matters put forth a recommendation to the Council in regards to Ordinance 17.265, an ordinance relative to taxis and vehicles for hire. At this meeting, I was the only attendee with specific interests in the aforementioned ordinance, which seems odd considering the number of taxis and liveries doing business in Northampton. In reference to Ordinance 17.265, which is up for a first reading tonight, um, under Section 1, Article 316-19, Subsection A, Paragraph 2, the proposed change on insurance requirements from 100, 300, that's 100 per person, 300, per accident in Greenfield, um, sorry, to 250, 500, which is proposed, seems overbearing and would make Northampton the highest uh, rates in Massachusetts. The range in Mass is anywhere from 2040, which is 20,000 per person, 40,000 per accident in Boston, to 100, uh, 300 in Greenfield and currently in Northampton. New York City is currently 100, 300. These changes are not em economically feasible for our market and would certainly make it financially unrealistic for any taxi company to be licensed in North Carolina. In reference to Section 1, Article 316-21, of which I am not entirely sure how it reads as recommended by the Committee on Legislative Matters, it does refer to fixed meters or app-based software in taxis. We have struggled to give our customers the best rates possible. We offer fixed rates which can be quoted ahead of time and are based off a zone system. I believe our customers appreciate uh, this, many of whom are elderly, handicapped, disabled, and live on a fixed income. We take pride in our ability to offer the best rates and would hope to continue in the same manner as we have for the past five years. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Jeff, I don't know, are you going to stick around for the discussion? Okay. Um, anyone else? Okay. So the process is now that I'm going to ask the clerk to call the roll. 
uh, we'll determine that we have a quorum and then we'll go into our regular meeting at which point our turn to talk and then uh, I ask everyone to be respectful and, and refrain from comments and, and noise. Yes. This isn't a public comment. This is just a, a process thing because I'm a stickler for the public uh, for public meeting law. Uh, Bear do now Daily Hampshire Gazette. Um, just so I make sure that I spell anybody's name correctly with quoting at some point, either now or at a quieter part of the meeting, I'd like to just uh, get a copy or take a picture of the of the sign up list. Just um, yes, you're welcome. There, it's a public document. As it is so a public document. Yeah, it's okay. a public document. And again, I could just go and skirt around there, but I prefer to get. You know, well, we'll we'll get it to you. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, please call the roll. Councillor Bidwell. Here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor Dwight. Uh, here. Councillor Klein. Here. Councillor LaBarge. Present. Councillor Murphy. Here. Councillor Nash. Here. Councillor O'Donnell. Here. Councillor Shaw. Here. All right, we have a quorum, so we, have now, we are now convened. First up actually is a poll petition for National Grid. This is item 17.365 on Woodmont Road. This is a public hearing, and this is in accordance with the provisions of Section 22, Chapter 166 of the General Laws. Uh, a public hearing is scheduled regarding the petition of National Grid to erect poles, wires upon, along, under, or across many public ways. Move to open the public hearing. Second. Motions are made to <coughs> open the public uh, hearing and seconded. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell, Councilor Klein did the second. Uh, all those in favor of opening the public hearing, please aye. say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. Uh, we'll hear from petitioners first. Is the petitioner here? Uh, Lisa, is you, are you back there? Oh, not again. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, in the absence of a petitioner with an explanation, I to continue the public hearing. Second. Motions made to continue public hearing and seconded. All those in favor of the continuance, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Now, so much for that public hearing. Uh -huh. uh, now we come up to recognition and one minute announcements. Uh, Council LaBarge. Um, yes, I have um, distributed on each of the councilors' desks a community forum. It's a presentation of the West Farms and Park Street Cemetery Preservation and Enhancement Plan. It's a process of preparing a long-term master plan for preserving and enhancing both Park Street and West Farms Cemetery is nearing completion. Prior to finalizing the plan, the City of Northampton would like to hear your thoughts ideas and preferences on the draft plan. Please join the Park Street and West Farm Cemetery Advisory Committee on September 26th and voice your thoughts and opinions. And we had a very, very good turnout with the first open hearing that we had. The place will be at the Florence Civic Center, 90 Park Street, Florence, Mass, when September 26th, time 7 to 8.30 p.m. And this event is sponsored by the Park Street and West Farm Cemetery Advisory Committee. And I can talk for Ward um, 6. We have had historians that have come and volunteered a lot of research for the Ward 6 Association and me. Wendy Foxman, she's the one that really pushed me into motivating and getting people to look at that cemetery, which um, we have come a long way. So. If any of the counselors are available, please try to attend this hearing. Council Murphy and then Council Klein. I just wanted to wish everybody a very happy uh, 5778. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Council Klein. Well, you stole his son. Someone he stole, stole my son. Oh. <laughs> um, I was just yeah, going to say, <laughs> way to say it is Shana Tova. There you um, go. <laughs> Happy New Year. Um, and I also just wanted to note that um, I was told by a number of members of the public that they weren't able to be here to offer their public comment on the cameras specifically for two reasons. One, because it is uh, the eve of the second day of Rosh Hashanah. And um, the other is the loss of a member of our greater community in Springfield, Jeff at Robles. His um, 
memorial services tonight. And so a lot of people went to that to um, pay their respect to somebody who did incredible activism and organizing in the greater community. Councilor Shara. Uh, this Saturday, um, September 23rd, Emerge Massachusetts is holding a Women Organizing to Win event. Wow. Um, that's in the parlor room uh, from 12 to 4 um, at 32 Masonic Street. There's going to be a panel of women leaders talking about their experiences and how to engage civically, including myself. Um, and there's also going to be a training on principles of a campaign and um, other networking opportunities. So it's free and open to the public. They ask that you do um, RSVP, though, and you can do that at emergema.org. Anyone else? Okay, move on to the next item, which is item 17.396. This is a resolution opposing the installation of municipally operated surveillance technology downtown. This will be a first reading. Uh, <coughs> This is upon the recommendations of uh, Councilors Ryan R. O'Donnell, Elisa F. Klein, and William H. Dwight. Um, item 17.396, a resolution. And this is, a, as I said, opposing the installation of municipally operated surveillance technology downtown. Whereas, downtown Northampton thrives culturally and economically, in part due to a free and open civic atmosphere. And whereas, people have the right to not be constantly surveyed, as well as certain rights relative to the data that may be collected on them. And whereas while video footage is often used to identify suspects after a crime, research strongly suggests that surveillance cameras do not effectively deter crime. And whereas surveillance <coughs> has been shown to alter legitimate and non-criminal behavior and produce a chilling effect on free expression. And whereas surveillance can lead to a diminished public trust in law enforcement, conflicting with the trust built by Northampton's community policing efforts, and whereas surveillance in Northampton does not pass the test of necessity because alternatives such as community policing are available, and whereas surveillance in Northampton does not uh, pass the test of proportionality because clearly defined and ongoing problems of a severity outweighing the aforementioned drawbacks have not been demonstrated, and whereas policies regarding the use of surveillance technology, including the question of data retention and sharing, public notification, internal auditing requirements, and others should not be set exclusively by the agency that is governed by those policies, but rather codified in laws that are subject to public oversight. And whereas overly broad public surveillance is inconsistent with an open and democratic society. Now therefore be it resolved that the City Council opposes the permanent installation of additional municipally operated surveillance technology in public spaces in downtown Northampton. I'll accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Second. Uh, discussion. Councilor Murphy and then Councilor Bidwell. And then Councilor I'd Klein. I'd respectfully like to move that we continue this in favor of the ordinance. I think it, the, the ordinance has an established process where it gets referred to committee. There's a lot more public input and comment. And I think it prejudices the ordinance process to do a resolution now and then later refer an ordinance to committee. I think it prejudices that committee process it prejudices the collection of more comment from people to do the ordinance after we do the resolution I'd like to let the ordinance run its course I'd like to have it collect the comment that ordinances are set up to collect to be referred to as many committees as we want to refer it to uh, get more comment than we had here tonight and then and bring it back you know I'd like to talk to Chief Casper she is very much in favor of it she was not here to speak to us tonight I'd like to get more input from the chamber. In fact, I think the chamber said they'd like that to happen. They'd like the process to continue. And I think doing the resolution tonight prejudices that entire process. Uh, and it, 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 it truly limits the comment we get on the issue to those who came tonight, one of whom, Chief Casper, is a, a key component of this that I'd like to speak to. So I don't want to diminish the feelings about the resolution, but I think it's inappropriate to conduct a vote and draw a conclusion on the resolution one way or the other prior to the ordinance process. I think that's deliberate, inclusive, and, and I, I don't see any real hurry in this. Um, there are no cameras up now. There are not going to be cameras up until after the process uh, concludes, or maybe not at all, depending on how the process concludes. So I, I, is that a motion? That was a, a motion to continue uh, until after the ordinance runs its course. Hearing none, uh, Councilor Klein, you 
you were next. Um, uh, no, I'm sorry, Councilor Bidwell was next. Oh, you heard yeah, there was a second. Uh, there, oh, was there was a second? Oh, second. oh a second. Yeah. Okay, so, all right. So for the, on the point of continuance then. So now we're not speaking to the resolution, we're speaking to the continuance. Uh, Councilor Donnelly, you had your hand up and. Well, just as the author of the resolution, I'd like to present it uh, because we should understand the reasons why it's being brought forward before we decide not to discuss it. So I wonder if, if I would have an opportunity to do that. I can do that initially by way of speaking to the motion to continue. Uh, would you, as so long as you frame it, as counsel. you frame it, uh, in, yeah, if you continue to frame it in, in the discussion of, of the continuance. Let me make a brief comment in that case. There's a question, this is actually a non-substantive discussion, if you will, because it, we're not talking about the merits of surveillance one way or the other. We're talking about whether we should discuss it even. I find that curious since there were so many calls for more discussion. Um, at the public forum that Chief Casper organized last week, which I think she did, she was right to organize that forum, and I appreciate it. It was actually she who said that that kind of discussion was helpful to her not the opposite. It's not harmful to talk about it. The city council is, as we all know, the representatives of the people. You represent a ward, you represent at large, you're some of your constituents here tonight. Um, it is our job to help continue the discussion. Um, you can have meetings that are public forums. You can have private meetings with the Chamber of Commerce. How then can we not discuss this here in the City Council? So I feel very strongly, although I respect Councilor Murphy's opinion, I feel very strongly that the Council has a role uh, to do this. Um, and I would at least like the opportunity to present uh, the argument. Now, there's an additional difference. The ordinance is going to take a while. The ordinance is about codifying principles. And in fact, it is the perfect opportunity for more debate and I would, I would ask and expect Chief Casper and business owners and citizens and counselors and the mayor to get around that table. That ordinance is not going to be passed for a while. Uh, let's do that to codify the principles. But before that time, we have an immediate issue that's in our community. It's an issue of, of enormous community interest. Why would we not weigh in on it tonight? So I'm against continuing, respectfully. Some, uh, anyone else on the point of continuance, Councilor Bidwell? I guess I would I would agree that <clears throat> since we've heard so much uh, presentation here already, uh, and some of us has, have probably given some thought to what we want to contribute as counselors to the conversation, I, I think we should proceed with a uh, with a discussion here and now. Councilor Murphy, you wanted to respond. My point here is not to preclude discussion is to preclude conclusion. If we vote to accept this ordinance, that, uh, or we, the resolution tonight, then why, what we're saying is we're gonna pass the ordinance anyway. You know, if we, we can talk about it, but if we vote on this resolution tonight and this council draws a conclusion, it's gonna totally prejudice the ordinance process who people are gonna say, ah, the damn council's gonna vote for it anyways, why should I bother coming out and talking about it? That's my concern, not to limit our debate, but to, to focus our debate in the ordinance process without preliminarily drawing a conclusion and then sending it off to the ordinance process. I think it's, it's gonna limit debate if we make up our mind tonight on the, on the uh, resolution and then say, oh yeah, enjoy the ordinance process, but you already know we've made up our mind, so don't worry about it. Council Shara. Um, I I would agree with Councilor Murphy, and actually I was going to make a similar motion, but I was, I was going to wait until the sponsors had a chance to introduce it and, and talk about it first. Um, and this is not, it's not a new position for me. Um, I've expressed this in the past. I find it problematic to invite and encourage the public to share their views with us and have built into our public meetings a time and a space for that input and expect them to f feel like they're fully heard um, when a body's already indicated that they've decided an issue. Um, so I feel like a vote on this resolution in either direction would do that. Um, and what I would like to see, what my preference would be to have it 
be referred to the same committees that the ordinance is referred to. That, so that would be um, city services and legislative matters. That way it tracks with the ordinance and the discussions can happen at the same time. That's my preference. Uh, Council LaBarge. Thank you, Council, Councilor Shearer, because I do agree with that. I think the resolution and the ordinance should both be referred to city services and legislative matters. And I do know because I have been going back and forth with um, Chief Jody Casper, and she is very, very willing to go ahead and sit down with us with the meetings and have a round table and whoever is designated to do that to try to come to a good compromise here. And I think this is what it's all about. It's all about us, all of us in the community. There's no question about it. We all work together. We all protect and keep each other safe. And that's what we want. Do I agree about the cameras and so forth? I don't like cameras. Body cameras, I, I don't have a problem with that. But I just feel because of the pros and cons, there needs to be more dialogue. I am getting so many calls and even residents who have concerns about slowing it down, let's not rush this, let's do the <coughs> right process. And I think people really should have the rights to be able to come to the hearings and say how they feel about a situation here with the cameras. So I have to agree with um, Councilor Shearer. Councilor Klein. Um, with great respect for my colleagues who are calling for this motion, I, um, I don't see that this resolution is any different than any resolution we've ever discussed on the floor and voted on. Um, we do have a process as a council. We can put on our agenda a resolution and the expectation is that we're going to discuss it on the floor and we're going to make a decision. I don't think it, I, I feel like there's a, a almost like a censure going on here that I think is really problematic because um, there's concern about the outcome. I think there are numerous people who incredibly articulately, ex articulately more than I am, express themselves um, with regard to this. This is an open meeting. There was knowledge across all spectrum of opinion about this, that this meeting was taking place and that there was going to be an opportunity for public comment, that we were going to be considering this resolution. I personally talked to people at the swimming pool, on the phone, by email, on both sides of the, the debate. Um, I encouraged all of them to come to this meeting. Certainly, Chief Casper and her police force knew that this was happening and had the opportunity to come to this meeting. I, I find this really a problematic um, motion to essentially shut down a process that is a process established by this council um, forever and it's the way that things are done. And so to try and shut down discussion about a resolution just feels extremely undemocratic to me. Dr. Nash. <clears throat> yeah, I'm, I'm feeling stuck too. And that um, I, 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 um, I, I um, understand Councillor Murphy's position and Councillor Klein's position. It, it, it seems that, you know, here we are, we're, 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 we're gridlocked at an intersection of how to have this discussion. Um, I, I, there, a lot of work has been done. I, I think I would like to hear read into the record tonight, you know, both, uh, both the ordinance and the resolution. Um, but at the same time, I, I feel like we've gone from a very, you know, I, I thought that, that meeting last week was actually, it was pretty remarkable. I thought uh, Chief Casper handled things um, in, in an amazing way. Um, I, I recognize that, you know, I, I was also moved by the, the, the depth of feeling that was expressed by many people, um, that, there is, um, that there is a lot of fear and there is a lot of concern for many people in our community and, um, and it's legitimate. It's not made up, you know, um, that, that 
what's going on at the federal level has us all very scared and that people are being arrested and deported and people are being kicked out of the military for um, for reasons of who they are so we have evidence that to be concerned um, but I, I, I I'm tonight I just want is there a way we can figure out how so we can slow it down just a little bit more and um, that I mean part of what's going on, I, I um, I've had a lot of really good conversations with people I've had phone calls with people I, I sat out in our silly little parklet today and was trying to get work done and talk to like five different people had a great conversation with Arthur Apostolo, Apostolo about you know what it used to be like at S Smith Folk and where we are today and you know and how we have moved from you know one key to get in the building to you know buzz into the high school security state um, and I, I think this is an important discussion for us to have and that um, and what what's what was really fulfilling about all of these conversations was that you know we started you know you know Jim I'm against that ordinance and you know or you know I'm against those cameras and I I get it you know and also I would like to have a broader conversation about surveillance I mean um, three months ago we voted in cameras for our school system I raised the concern for that here just in my comment wasn't very strong it was just simply saying it's a sign of the times you know that we're, we're voting for this and then we all voted it in we didn't have that conversation then but we are having it now and it's centered around and the other thing that bothers me is that concerns me is we're having it around a similar boundary line that we've had it around in the past it's our downtown against business owners against you know people on the street and it's, I think it's much bigger than that. That, you know, it has to do with the parking garage, it has to do with our schools. Hey, Councilor, I'm sorry to interrupt, but we were speaking to the continuance of so, the resolution. I, I'm sorry. So I, um, so I would be supportive of the continuance, but at the same time, I, out of respect for everybody here tonight, I would like to hear both read into the record. Sure. Um, I, you know, I, I take real issue with the idea that this is censure or that I'm trying to somehow limit the conversation because that's exactly the opposite of what I would like to do with this. I would like to continue the conversation and have it be as broad as possible and have as many opportunities for people to speak as possible. Um, and and I also I disagree that this resolution is like any other resolution we've ever right. put forth. We. I, I don't remember a time, people can, re can correct me if I'm wrong, when we've put forward a resolution at the same time that we put forward legislation that goes with it. That makes it a very different thing to me. Um, it's not just a resolution that is t telling our aspirations, there is also a legislative aspect to it that has to go through the process. So I think that there is a difference between at, with this resolution. So while acknowledging the differences, uh, <coughs> there is a difference. A resolution, of course, and this is for the public at large to understand, a resolution bears no way to law, has no, it is nothing beyond an expression, aspirational or otherwise, by the council I if it's collectively approved. Uh, an ordinance, which is the <coughs> item that the other councilors are referring to, does carry the way to law. That is, and, and for folks who are trying to follow along, the concern here, and I'll be corrected if I'm wrong, is that the resolution, the expression of the resolution will somehow muddy the waters in the discussion of the ordinance. Um, to that extent, in, in the content of this resolution, which I just read, <coughs> actually speaks more to how we philosophically feel, rather, and not how we codify, but how we philosophically feel about the notion of municipally managed surveillance systems, which I think is not an inappropriate thing to debate now as, as, as before we go to the issue of legislating. It does not presume an outcome on the ordinance because 
I fully expect the ordinance to be modified, amended, and adapted during the discussion with the police chief, among others. Um, I suspect that that will look um, substantially different in a lot of ways, but more attention to detail. And then in each case, each one has to survive a vote. Now, clearly, we already have, in this course of the discussion of a continuance, a divided vote. So, just again, speaking for me personally, I get excited when we have a divided vote. I think the idea is it would, because a divided vote <coughs> prompts a thoughtful discussion and debate. And that's what I would like to move forward with personally on this resolution, to have a thoughtful discussion about the philosophical dimensions or the philosophical impacts of surveillance in the main. And then we can discuss once it comes, once it goes through the committee process and once it comes to this floor, again, possibly should it survive the ordinance and if we do codify it and how we regulate it. Councilor Murphy. Well, I know I agree entirely with you that part of the ordinance process, part of all of the testimony and all of the committee work is to get to the truth at the bottom of the issue. There's some truth to get to in this resolution itself. It says people have the right not to be constant constantly surveyed. You are already, folks. The cameras are everywhere. This is not going to make a big difference. It's, you're going to be looked at by a police camera. You already looked at at probably 50 cameras in Northampton. So, so Council, you're debating, uh, you're debating the resolution right uh, now, so, so be careful. I, I would prefer to just speak to the continuance point. Please. Uh, you know, please. I, I think the point I want to make is that as a council, there are elements of this resolution that some of us might agree with and elements that some of us don't agree with. We should have the opportunity, if they follow each other through the ordinance process, to come up, you know, there are parts of this I don't agree with, there are parts of it I do agree with. If it goes with the process that the ordinance goes with, we might be able to come up with a resolution and an ordinance that everybody can agree with. But what we're saying tonight is no. The ordinance stands the way the ordinance was written. You can't change it, you just have to vote it up or down. Perhaps if it follows the process, perhaps if we hear more voices, perhaps we can come up with a revised resolution that more of us can sign on to. But we want to preclude that and just discuss and vote on it tonight, which I truly believe prejudices the rest of the process and also doesn't allow us to simultaneously learn from everybody involved with this and maybe come up with a resolution that matches an ordinance that we're all comfortable with. Well, of course, it doesn't preclude the development of a second resolution, Lord knows. We that still prejudices the rest of the we do, we do, and, and, if, and I think then what you're presuming, of course, is, is a passage, that this passes as a resolution, which of course can also as a resolution well, be. the other? Well, it's, it's, fail, it's going to prejudice the rest of the process. Let me, let me finish. And then it, it also presumes that it can't be amended or discussed while we have it on the floor. I think all those things, all those are allowed in the context of the debate. So a continuance doesn't change that one way or the other. <coughs> And a resolution that if, if you were um, inclined to have a resolution that would companion the final outcome of the ordinance, that's certainly you're capable of drafting that as well. So it could, it would more reconcile with the ordinance. This doesn't refer to the ordinance. It doesn't, uh, other than it, its only rhyming scheme is that it is speaking on, can, uh, you know, uh, uh, municipally managed surveillance systems. Can I reply? Please. Yeah. That it, this ordinance was written by three people and heavily supported by the 50 people who came to the meeting tonight. I'd like to hear from more people than the three of you that wrote it, and it represents your opinion, and the 50 people that had the time to show up here tonight to speak about it. Um, if we vote on it one way or the other tonight, we preclude all that. Uh, Council LaBarge and then Councilor Klein. Thank you. Councilor oh, it was someone over there. Oh, Councilor. Well, just to make well, well, council, let's do Council LaBarge first, oh, and, excuse then, me. and then and then Council O'Donnell and Council Klein. Just a question, um, Councilor Dwight. When because I had gotten a call on this today, and I wasn't sure or not would the resolutions that are designed by whoever the sponsors are, since we have two, an ordinance plus a resolution coming in the same evening at City Council, 
does our city solicitor also look at our resolutions? That's my question. The resolutions, of course, as I said, it's don't carry the weight of law, so it wouldn't eat, it, it, so it's an expression. There's no law here in this. So as such, the city solicitor, it is presumed that whatever we say, whether we say hats are stupid, for instance, as a resolution, that doesn't violate any law and doesn't come up against mass general law. Wouldn't be a very good resolution, but it, what I'm saying is, it's not necessary for it to be vetted by the solicitor. The ordinance, however, is, and that, and of course, that becomes during the process of legislative matter. So my question is, since we were looking at possibly sending both of them to the two committees, he would have to look at the language on this, if that came. He he, uh, he reads the agenda. What's on the items that are on the agenda for the legislative matters? That's correct. Thank you, uh, Councilor Donald and Councilor Klein. Resolutions require two readings. Mm -hmm. Why? Because we don't pass anything hastily. If there's one thing you can say about government in general, and probably <laughs> the Northampton government, which in this case is a good thing, is that we don't do things overnight. There's a process, and we have two readings for a reason. So I can understand when Councilor Nash wants time. But I'd say that's built in like all the other resolutions. The other difference between this resolution and some of the others we pass is that it has a direct effect on municipal policy. I support weighing in on, on, many, on other issues. I've, I've done them myself, issues that are outside of the scope of the city council. I like this because it does affect an issue that's of great concern today in, in the city. I view it as my job to weigh in on those issues. And for whatever resolution is brought forward, I also view it as my job to study it and prepare in advance. And I think the fact that we have two readings, there are two opportunities separated by two weeks uh, where that can happen. And even after that's done, as others have pointed out very, very correctly, it's a non-binding resolution. Mm -hmm. And there's more discussion to be had about the ordinance which codifies things for the future. But I read op-ed pieces in the Gazette, um, and letters from, from the public, and I, I read a commentary by the chief of police today, which made very clear um, the viewpoint of the exec. The person who said that the legislative branch has a role is absolutely correct. Uh, maybe it's almost a compliment to us. I can't think of any other legislative body that would so will, willingly give up uh, its own power, its own ability to weigh in on something. Maybe that's even like a good thing. Maybe we're too nice. Um, but I think it's our job. I think we need to show leadership on this issue. Yes or no? My colleagues don't agree with me. We disagree. That's okay. <coughs> but we need to debate the issue because it matters to the city right now. Uh, any Councilor? Council <coughs> oh, no, Councilor Carney has not spoken. Um, so. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll just speak a little bit to the notion of um, continuing. Uh, I can understand. <clears throat> I can understand the. Uh, it's because these two are linked. Our resolution and our ordinance are linked. And even though I, I think uh, a previous speaker mentioned that we haven't really had this linkage, we actually did back in January with the wage compliance and in and uh, um, certificates. Oh, uh, for those for licenses and at the same time the resolution for a fair employment city and we did time those I was just checking back we timed those to actually come for their first and second readings together um, so we actually had them referred previously <clears throat> the order the order was referred and then we brought the resolution and the the actual vote on the order the full council vote to the same meeting so, I mean, I, I do understand the reasoning that Councillor Murphy, and I, I don't think it's to, and, and I think there's a possible, what we can do is actually postpone, not vote on the motion to continue right now. We could actually vote on the, re I mean, uh, d have introduced the discussion on the resolution and then postpone the vote so that we brought the votes together uh, of the resolution and the order. Um, 
and referred those to more discussion, had, had the opportunity for more discussion prior to vote at the city services and legislative matters committees. So I think there is, you know, there's kind of a middle ground here where we can still have the discussion that a lot of people, I don't think that there's any intention by any council okay. here to limit discussion from what I've heard. Mm -hmm. And if we have it tonight and then again further at, because we will have it, the order, the order is being referred. So we are going to have a discussion at city services and legislative matters. It's whether or not we, we vote tonight on the resolution or bring them together for the full vote by the council at when they come, when they go through the committee process. And so I don't see that as necessarily squashing. So it's, um, okay, so um, the, it, should it come to that, there may be a second motion there. After, if, if this survives a continuance, then you may be introducing that. Well, no, my question was can we actually postpone a vote on continuing yes, until we've had the discussion that. I believe that we can post, postpone it. Yes, we can. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm happy to withdraw my motion to continue this to another meeting. We can discuss it until 2 in the morning as long as we don't vote on the resolution until we let the ordinance run its process because I don't want us drawing a conclusion one way or the other to in any way affect the ordinance. I think the two need to go together. And if what we want to do is talk ourselves blue on this tonight, that's fine with me as long as we don't vote on it until the ordinance runs its process. If we tie the two together and vote on both together, that's fine. Because then we get a lot more input and, and have an opportunity to discuss the resolution or perhaps amend the resolution along with the ordinance so that we're all more comfortable with it. I just don't want to do one, do this before the ordinance has a chance to be vetted and get all that extra public input. Council Sherry, you were the second. If we were to move to refer it to committee, would we have to postpone it, or wouldn't it just then get referred to right. committee? It would, we, then we would vote on the referral. Right. Uh, so we now we're, this is still on the motion of continuance here. So I don't know if it's withdrawn or not. I've got. A, I haven't heard definitively one way or another. I heard that you'd be happy to withdraw it, provided there was a motion to continue the vote. Am I correct, uh, Councilor? Point of order. Sure. That's the same thing. I mean, it's a continuing. Not voting on something is continuing it. Yeah. So, just it's to be a clear about that. One would allow a debate, one would not. The difference being. Uh, so, on the, where do we stand on the motion of continuance, uh, Council Murphy? Um, I'm prepared to ask the second if we will withdraw it, uh, so long as we have the opportunity to. Uh, postpone the vote or refer it to committee or not act on it until it gets vetted along with the ordinance. So yes, I'll withdraw my, my motion to continue. Okay. So that will give us an opportunity to uh, have another debate on the motion. But currently now we're back to the original motion, which was the resolution. Uh, and uh, Councilor O'Donnell, I believe you were queued up to introduce your uh, resolution. Sure. Um, well, I'm grateful for the chance to, to talk about it tonight. I think it's important. Um, again, I think it's squarely within the council's responsibilities to discuss this issue. And far from detracting from the debate, I think it increases it. This is another forum for representative, uh, representatives of the city to, to be heard. First thing I'd like to do is talk about what this resolution is not and does not do, because I've heard and read many things from people I respect very much, and a lot of it, I think, bears to be called out because it doesn't actually have anything to do with this resolution. So let me run through about four things. First of all, this resolution, rightly or wrongly, and again, amendments are in order tonight, and not everyone may agree with it, but here's what the resolution does. This resolution has nothing to do with things that are outside of the central business district. It's about downtown. So, for example, when people cite uh, the human trafficking sting that was set up, that happened at 176 Pine Street in Florence. That was good. It's nothing to do with this resolution, which is about downtown. When people bring up temporary cameras that were installed on North Street, 
after the, the suspicious fires last year in Ward 3, not the major fires from uh, years ago, but the ones that were like last year, and temporary cameras were set up on North Street. Resolution doesn't speak to that. Temporary cameras generally, the ones that are put up on first night for the Pride Parade and for safe passage. This, this ordinance is about, this resolution is about permanent cameras, non-fixed cameras, cameras that are in police cruisers. This resolution is silent on those. <coughs> Certain buildings, like the parking garage and the police headquarters, this resolution says we're opposed to additional surveillance. Now we get into the other, th other stuff with the ordinance. But this is about right now, the proposal that's brought forward by the mayor and the chief of police to expand surveillance. And finally, I'd like to dispel a very important, um, this is very important to me, and a very sort of dangerous thing in my opinion. We have to dispel the notion that public safety and democratic debate and accountability to protect people's rights are incompatible. They're not. We, they, they can both be done, and we must try to do both of them. So when we say we're going to debate this, it's not disrespectful uh, to that ideal. Um, let me also say, I'll, I'll leave it to others to, to speak more to the merits of it. One final thing. I sort of have a, a challenge to my colleagues, kind of a fun-loving fun -loving challenge offered in, uh, in the best possible way. The challenge is, can we debate this tonight while dropping proper nouns of people's names. So let's not talk about Mayor Narkowitz or Chief Casper or Council President Dwight or Ryan O'Donnell or Council Shara. Let's talk about the mayor, the chief of police, and the city council because we're talking about a policy that is not just, it's in reaction to something today, but it's something that has an effect into the future. And when we take that level of, of personality out of it, I think we'll be much, uh, we, we, we can think about it in a much clearer and, and more sober way. Um, so let me, let me say one final thing, because I know I've talked for a while. Here's how I think of it. Even if you are in favor of surveillance equipment downtown, you are operating on a premise, whether you know it or not, that you believe there are certain times and places and circumstances where that surveillance is warranted. And it follows automatically that there are times and places and circumstances where it is not warranted. Unless you, you know, are crazy and you think that camera should be in every room in the world or something, but no one thinks that. Everyone believes that there are times when it's legitimate and times it is not. So what is the difference? How do you tell the difference? I think there are two reasonable tests we can apply. First is the test of necessity. And the second is the test of proportionality. What's something that's necessary? Something that's necessary has no alternatives or no feasible alter alternatives, or the alternatives are worse than the proposal. Is that the case in Northampton? No, because we have an alternative, which is called community policing, building connections with people in the community in a way that we at least try. We may not do it perfectly. In fact, I can guarantee you we don't, but we try to do it. We believe in it. That's an alternative that works. Let's invest in that even if it were necessary. It's not a proportionate response. Again, there are times when the judicious deployment of surveillance technology is warranted. For example, if we're around, and others would disagree with me. I bet there's people in the audience who don't agree with me on this. If you're around the United States Capitol building, is some surveillance equipment warranted? What if you're in Copley Square in Boston or around the time of the Boston Marathon every year? Is that warranted? What about first night in Northampton? I would say all, there are compelling arguments for all three of those things, but that is not Northampton. The facts on the ground do not demonstrate that the, this measure would be in proportion to the problem. So I respect the motivations of the mayor and the, and the chief of police for bringing it forward. I respect those who disagree with me but it doesn't meet the test of necessity and it is not proportionate to the facts on the ground in Northampton. So that's how I look at it. Um, uh, Council Klein was next and, then, and also one of the sponsors and then Council Murphy. Move it to me here, my technology is not working. 
Um, okay, so I first want to thank Councillor O'Donnell for moving very quickly on uh, writing this resolution um, and inviting me to uh, share it with him and Councillor Dwight. Um, I have several concerns about the proposal to install the cameras in downtown Northampton, and I'm gonna start with the practical and the criminological, but I'm also gonna speak to the privacy and civil liberties issues and to the social justice implications as well. Um, the costs, this is the practical. Uh, the costs associated with video surveillance are not fixed and finite as one might believe. There are hidden costs that have not been part of the conversation about installing the cameras. Um, after the initial, initial capital costs, there are the ongoing costs that are necessarily demanded by technology, as well as the human costs, um, such as staffing and training. Uh, technology is not seamless. It needs constant repairs and upgrades, and the human costs associated with surveillance cameras are steep and ongoing as well. <coughs> Um, surveillance cameras are known to simply move misbehavior or criminal behavior to other unmonitored areas where the risks could ultimately be steeper. That is, places where there are no other members of the community around to act as bystanders or people who will observe or intervene. Um, and this has been shown through uh, research to be an issue of surveillance cameras. Cameras um, don't work to deter, prevent, or reduce crime. Many people um, uh, offered public comment about that. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell mentioned this. Um, it, this has been shown in numerous studies from other locations where cameras have been used for a while now. They may aid marginally in apprehending people after the fact, but again, the proportionality of that small benefit to my mind does not justify the potential harms of installing surveillance cameras. I'm also concerned about how residents' perceptions of safety are affected by the installation of surveillance cameras in our downtown. Their installation um, necessarily creates and reifies the perception of a lack of safety. Um, it can create a sense of fear among city residents. In fact, studies done on students in schools with surveillance cameras show that there's a negative correlation of students' sense of safety at the school um, to how safe the schools really are. That is when data um, proves that the schools are actually safe, students feel unsafe because of the presence of surveillance cameras. Um, there are significant privacy and civil, civil liberties issues, as has been noted, um, who will have ongoing ownership of the images once they're recorded. Um, we have no ironclad assurances, as many people noted, that the images won't be shared with federal authorities. Um, we've heard from many people about the chilling effects of surveillance cameras on how we move through public spaces. <coughs> the philosopher Michel Foucault, you can't talk about surveillance without talking about Foucault, called this internalized coercion, something that's achieved by allowing people with power to constantly observe and record those with less power. While the chief of police has made the argument that the NPD will become more efficient and have another tool for fighting crime by installing the cameras, my concern is that the power that's already bestowed upon a police force crosses even further into the realm of power run amok. Um, I want to address the social justice aspects of surveillance cameras in our downtown. In this era of militarized and technologized police, there are not just privacy and civil liberties issues here but issues that relate to race and class. Our society over the last several decades has become increasingly punitive. Um, many call it punishment creep, and it's made its way into even our local policing efforts, and the effects are felt most distinctly by people of color, poor people, and people who are homeless. And this was noted by a number of folks here uh, this evening. Millions of young men are incarcerated across the United States, and not only are people of color and poor people among the incarcerated, incarcerated at disproportionate rates, but the vast preponderance are incarcerated for nonviolent crimes, the exact kinds of nonviolent crimes that are more likely to be recorded by our downtown surveillance, surveillance cameras. The kinds of crimes that are, <coughs> excuse me, are most likely to produce arrests based on surveillance footage. And so our cameras would play a role in the reinforcing of the incarceration state, of mass incarceration in this country. <coughs> What's more, I believe the move to install surveillance cameras in our downtown needs to be contextualized within a particularly troubling, changing policy environment here in the city. 
There are other phenomena here in Northampton that I think are directly related to the proposal to install cameras and about which I feel deep concern. And some of these were discussed again uh, by folks with their public comment. It seems to me that we are ever inching towards becoming a more disciplinarian community, one in which we are policing others in an aggressive and power over way, and one in which we are co-opting people into regulating and policing themselves. One indication to me of this new disciplinarianism is the convening by the mayor of a panhandling task force to manage panhandling in the city. There hasn't been nearly enough transparency around this new body and its implications for panhandlers and other vulnerable folks who live on the streets of our city. Another area of concern for me is the request by the Northampton Police Department and the mayor's inclusion of this request in his five-year capital plan, this was mentioned by uh, Lois Ahrens, for funding for riot gear for the police department. Another is that the Northampton Police Department sent members of Northampton's police force, also noted by the public com in public comment, uh, to be trained in the jail of Sheriff Joe Arpaio, a man who is as Hitler-esque as any leader I've seen in this country, which is saying a lot these days. Um, I want to live in a city that does not set up expectations of our residents to be potential criminals, potentially violent, combustible or containable mobs, or that any of us is unwelcome in our downtown streets and anywhere else in this city. Surveillance cameras, riot gear, panhandling task forces, training in a jail called by one journalist, a circus of cruelty, these are all the markers of a community that is moving towards framing its residents as criminals, as violent, as unwanted, and as needing to be watched. I'm worried that with the cameras in place, we run the risk of managing trivial forms of misbehavior, particularly by people of color, people who panhandle, people with addictions, people who are homeless, in ways that are more aggressive than <coughs> necessary. Surveillance cameras pose not only civil liberties related risks, but compromise the dignity of people using our downtown streets, but especially those who live on the streets and ask for spare change. It changes how all of us will move through our downtown space, but it will affect most aggressively people of color, people without houses, and people who live on the streets and ask for money in the streets. And I know I've said that four times now, but I can't stress it enough. As Ward 7 resident Emily Woodward put so beautifully in a letter that she sent to all of us counselors, for generations, people in marginalized communities have been altering their public behavior for their own safety. I don't want to be a part of reinforcing the need for people of color to have to do this. Our society needs us to work towards reversing this, especially now in the days of Trumpism. In closing, I want to just um, talk about what kind of city I want to live in. I want to live in a city where we create and build community, not figure out how to exclude certain others and find ways to keep them off our streets. I want to live in a community where we take care of and look out for each other, not monitor and surveil each other. I want to live in a community where money is spent on ways to de-escalate with kindness, human conflagrations that might pose a danger. And I want that city to be our city of Northampton. Thanks. Well, just the first one, whereas I completely agree with. So we have some commonality there. The second one, the, of the right not to be constantly surveyed. Um, that's not true. Case law in Massachusetts says you have no expectation of privacy in public spaces. Hold them up. That's the way the law reads. You have no expectation of privacy in a public space. Uh, and you're already surveyed all over. By cameras, uh, no, and, please. And, okay. So you, but you are, but you already are, and you have no expectation of privacy. That's case law in Massachusetts. Um, the next two whereas is to me tend to contradict themselves. We know uh, that we have some evidence that they don't defer crime, but we also know they have a chilling effect. I mean, which is it? Do they? They don't deter crime, but they do have a chilling effect. I mean, they seem to contradict each other. But what they do do is solve crime. Uh, they do solve a lot of crimes, and I think the chief made the case that uh, that that's true, that they help that department solve crimes. And solving crimes protects the victims of, the, of those crimes. If you solve their crime, it protects victims and future victims. It's very, that is a very important thing. We talk in the next two about community policing and how we prefer community policing. Um, a shift of police officers in Northampton is what, about eight people at most to cover 30,000 people? 
Uh, speaker, tonight I already said that we spend too much on the police already, but we're going to defer to community policing. And, and we are constantly short, my experience on both um, the Public Safety Committee in past days and finally, <coughs> we're always trying to keep our department full. We always have shortages of police officers. We lost three of the state police the other day. We have good officers, the state police want them. But it's unrealistic to think that community policing is going to provide the kind of coverage that the police department will get from these cameras. And the cameras, you know, I know cameras, they're considerably more cost effective than people and they cover a lot more area. Um, as far as the data retention is concerned, that that also is to some extent covered by law. Um, and there's case law about that. It's not just as, as open as it's implied to be here. And again, the, the Massachusetts SJC has said that public surveillance is not inconsistent. It, it is, is, is the inconsistency between it and law is just not there. The SJC is, fi is fine with it in areas where there's no expectation of privacy. So in that sense, the, the resolution disagrees with the state Supreme Court. So I, I'd like to be able to come up with a resolution I could support, but there are several parts of this one that just do not ref reflect case law or facts on the ground, which is why I'm uncomfortable with it and why I'd like it to run along with the ordinance uh, so that it could be modified based on comments from attorneys, comments from the police chief, you know, a, a more thorough vetting of what is claimed to be facts in here that I see are just not the case. Councilor Bidwell, you are next. Uh, yes. Uh, I have comments on both the process of how we, how, how we get there and how and, and a, a recommendation I'm going to make for how we slow it down. Mm -hmm. um, as well as some comments about the importance of um, factual accuracy and relying on evidence as we're proceeding to make policy. Um, I haven't made up my mind whether it would be the right thing or the wrong thing for the city to install additional cameras downtown. It's a very complicated issue and there's a lot I don't yet know and I think there's a lot that we don't know. For example, what do studies of surveillance cameras in other communities tell us about their effectiveness in preventing downtime, downtown street and sidewalk crimes, specifically drug dealing? or in dealing with personal assaults or hate crimes or instances of police officer use of force? What can we learn from progressive communities like Seattle, San Francisco, and here in our own backyard, the town of Amherst? Clearly, these are communities that have not regarded surveillance cameras as a simplistic black and white issue. Rather, they've struggled with how to balance competing priorities consistent with progressive principles and have found their way to thoughtful use of surveillance cameras. What do we know of the experience of communities that have used surveillance technology within the context of adopting a so-called charter for a democratic use of video surveillance? Once I've learned more about all of this, and once I've had the opportunity to weigh pros and cons, I may very well conclude that this isn't the right approach for this city at this time. Or maybe I'd conclude that it is. The point is, I don't yet have the information I need to make an informed decision. And, and frankly, I don't think most other people do either. And the resolution before us certainly doesn't provide any answers to these questions. Opinions, yes. Answers, no. The resolution says, for example, research strongly suggests. Well, what research? Surveillance has been shown. Shown by whom? Surveillance can lead to a diminished public trust. According to what studies? Where's the evidence? I reviewed a study by researchers Brandon Welsh and David Farrington who conducted a so-called meta-analysis where they aggregate the results of 41 different studies rather than cherry-picking one or two from the U.S. and Europe and they concluded that surveillance cameras were associated with a 16 percent reduction in overall crime. Now is that study the be-all and end-all of all studies? Of course not. But it's a reminder to us that this is complicated and it's worthy of, worthy of careful thought before acting impulsively. If we're telling our constituents that we're making public policy on the basis of research and studies, I think we owe it to them to tell them what research and what studies we're referring to. We owe the police chief a big thank you for opening up the discussion of this topic. And we owe her the courtesy of giving her time to absorb the feedback she heard at last week's public forum and to give her time to do more research and come back with answers and further thoughts. I would have thought that a city council that talks often about inclusiveness 
about seeking out a range of opinions about democratic process might have wanted to allow for time and proper process and additional input before drafting measures on this critical issue. That's the process this body undertook when faced with mounting questions 18 months ago about the state of the downtown economy, with specific concerns about the treatment of restaurant workers, about panhandling, about store vacancies. We asked a committee to hold public hearings aimed at soliciting opinions on these matters from all downtown stakeholders, mm -hmm. to bring in city department heads and others, to look at the experience of comparable communities, to study expert reports, and after consideration of all this, and only then, to issue a report and, if appropriate, to bring back legislation to the Council. The Council didn't immediately then start adopting resolutions and drafting ordinances on any of these. Rather, rather than opt for an impulsive and reflexive response, we chose a deliberative and thoughtful response. Our process attached great importance to reaching out to stakeholder groups who might normally feel intimidated about speaking out in a setting like this. This process did indeed result in issuance of reports and drafting of resolutions and orders which were, in the end, adopted by the Council. But that's not what we're seeing in this instance. Instead, what's proposed is that here and now, we vote on a resolution, and here and now, we refer to committee an ordinance already drafted that would, with force of law, institute an outright ban on the city's use of surveillance cameras downtown while undermining crime-solving procedures of our police department already underway. If we were to adopt either of these measures, in my opinion, we would be saying, in effect, we have all the answers we need. We need no research. We need no studies. We need no experts. We'd be saying we don't need to reach out to stakeholders. For example, the business owners and workers who live daily with the complicated and at times threatening scene on our downtown streets, people who might not comfortably feel like stepping up to speak their concerns. I've heard from five people in the last few days who feel intimidated about standing up at a meeting like this for fear of being labeled anti-First Amendment mm -hmm. or insensitive to the needs of people on our streets. Given this environment, I greatly appreciate those who were here tonight and were willing to step up and, and offer an alternative view because it's not easy. If we were to adopt either of these measures, we would be saying we don't care about whether we tie the hands of our police chief and curtail existing crime investigation. Indeed, if we vote on these measures tonight, we would be saying we want to cut off the public conversation so thoughtfully launched by our police chief just a week ago. So with respect, I would ask that the sponsors of this resolution and ordinance withdraw these measures and that instead the council participate in the process the police chief and the mayor have proposed for continuing the discussion in a broadly representative committee or task force. We should be participating in an all-inclusive study of the issue of downtown surveillance cameras, a study that would seek out the views of all stakeholders, that would absorb the experience of other communities, that would provide an opportunity for the police chief to continue the conversation that she began a week ago and that might or might not, after thoughtful deliberation, yield a carefully considered resolution or ordinance. I do not understand the rush to judgment and I call on my colleagues to slow it down and to appreciate that it's possible to be progressive and thoughtful at the same time. Thank uh, you for Council LaBarge. Yes, and um, I did mention that when I spoke about slowing it down, and I think that's very valuable. And I also feel that talking with many people, down street again today with business people, and exactly, Councilor Bidwell, what you were talking about, about people feeling uncomfortable to come and speak. I've heard a lot about that. Uh, you know, with um, Chief Casper, I've been going back and forth because she wanted to know if we had any questions or anything. And she did, and this really opened my eyes to that there is no right to privacy in public spaces. But I'm still respectful of the concerns that were expressed about how people may feel knowing cameras are around. She knows, she's hearing. And that's very, very valuable. That transparency was there with her at that meeting. And the counselors that attended, we heard her say that. Then she is saying, this is why I would recommend a smaller group or committee to further explore this and to thoughtfully discuss this issue and determine if any sort of camera technology could be effectively used downstairs, I mean downtown, while still taking into consideration 
some of the concerns that were raised. So she's hearing what the concerns are. And like I said right from the beginning, you know, I think that we need to get into a committee, an advisory committee, the mayor and the police department, some city councilors, bringing it forth to committees because I know we can make it right. And that's what our city is all about. It's the transparency, the communication, and everybody working together. And also, Councillor, I had great concerns about the cost. And she said the estimated cost of the proposed camera program, as of cameras, over through four to five years, might be plan about 80,000. 80, but a modified camera program for focusing primary on specific areas could cost much less. The cost of cameras over 45 years might be 40K. While an officer, because I had concerns, why couldn't we take that money and use it for community policing? And she came out to say that while an officer's salary over that time could range from 60 to 70 per year, there is really so much more to consider on this proposal before decisions are made. I am happy to address some of these specific questions as the matter moves to legislative matters or public services. Uh, Council Shara and then Council Mark. Um, since community policing has been brought up many times and it's it's a part it's a component of this resolution I just wanted to uh, f make the point that, that going to the public first to have an open conversation about a difficult issue is community policing as at its very best and that um, so for everyone who likes the concept of community policing and wants more of it mm -hmm. and is calling for more of it that that is what this process is and what what her asking for that conversation was um, and open communication, transparency, asking for input from the community are all components of community policing. And I think that that should be recognized that, that this very process that she's brought forward is an element of that. Mm -hmm. um, since we've been around on this, I'd like to move we refer this to the same committees as the ordinance, uh, community resources, and uh, legislative matters. Before your before there's a second, I would like an opportunity to speak. Oh, you have to yeah. Right. <laughs> I, uh, the reason I sit and wait is because I'm the, I'm the supposed poobah who sits here, so I don't, I don't step on, I don't get to step on too many comments. But I, I, you know, the, to the issue of um, rush to judgment, actually, point in fact, this isn't a judgment on my part. This is kind of a visceral rejection or a visceral response and reaction to. Um, something that we all acknowledge that we've we've made accommodations the slow boiling of the frog and allowing for surveillance I mean the irony of course is much of this is debated on Facebook where many people conceded already in the process of signing up on Facebook or Instagram or even texting or snapchat you've already given over so much of your information at that point you're out, you're vulnerable but we've that level of accommodation of ceding our right to protect ourselves from observation is a visceral response. I admit that. And so not so much a rush to judgment, more of a, 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 a stimulus through some, I don't know, philosophical hardwiring that, that I possess. It, to Councilor Shara's point, City of Northampton invited conversation on this. Amherst did not. East Hampton didn't. Holyoke didn't. Belchertown didn't. San Francisco didn't. All these other communities did not <coughs> invite this conversation. They were done as a matter of policy. They were installed. So you, this is a little bit of bragging. And you know, I've, I've, I've heard some rather harsh criticisms about the way we conduct polity in this city and in the, in the discussion tonight, and I think it's wrong. I, we, uh, there are good people making good attempts at abiding by the, the, the concept of democracy. 
I mean, we, <laughs> City of Northampton took three and a half years to install LED lights because we debated it for three and a half years. No other community had the conversation. <laughs> the public was not invited to participate in that conversation. From top to bottom, this community is committed to that conversation, broader, expansive conversation. To the issue about people being intimidated from speaking, I understand it's difficult. But no one's, I mean, the worst thing that you're subjected to here besides maybe some, some critical comments is a group hug in some cases. The fact is, is that we like to and we would continue to promote the notion that everyone can speak. And if you have the convictions of your principles that you take the opportunity to speak and share those principles. There Regardless, I mean, part of this intimidation s concept also goes back to the way we discuss downtown. And we discuss it in a black or white way, but we also discuss it in a class way that disturbs me. And this is part of the visceral reaction. We talk about protecting ourselves. So that means <laughs> we're not talking about collectively all being protected under the same equal eye. We're talking about protecting ourselves. They're automatically making a distinction. That disturbs me. And one of the things is that people who, in many cases, uh, I've, you know, I've read letters in the paper and people who've contacted me and written letters to me and people I've spoken with say, if you're not doing anything wrong, you shouldn't have to worry. But that's absurd. <laughs> I mean, I, 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 if you're not doing it, no, please, please don't, please don't. If you're not doing anything wrong, if you're merely being a citizen, if you're merely conducting your life, you have nothing to worry about. Yes, you do. The possibility that someone's watching to make sure you're not doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. I gave up. I, th I thought I gained that certain autonomy when I, when my parents basically told me to get out of the house. That, that type of oversight was not one that I was willing to concede to anymore. I want my own agency. So, and I, and I think, and I do take your point to the supporting documentation. I think that's, I think that's appropriate. If we're going to make assertions here that um, reference studies, rather than just saying ambiguously studies, I think it should be clearer. I absolutely agree with that. I, I am proud of this community, and that, and I'm proud of the people who have had the courage to speak. I'm even proud of the people who've had the courage to yell at me. I'm proud of the people who are who have been discouraged from speaking. And and I, as I said before, one of the things I'm particularly excited about, and one of the reasons I want to see this go forward, was a debate a divided vote on the council floor, a debate and a discussion, a philosophical, profound, a profoundly philosophical discussion. That was well past due. We've sung kumbaya over and over and over again on resolution after resolution over after resolution, to the point that we've neutered them. They have no value. They have no substance. This <coughs> has weight. This has significance. This has meaning. This is real because we're talking about what it means to live within a community and all the points of conflict. <coughs> now we, it's interesting, I was watching the Holyoke mayoral debate last night. I know, I don't have a life and I'm sorry, but the fact is I sit and watch other communities debate issues. Every community so far is having this issue about panhandling. And we can't have this conversation without the fact that that keeps coming. <coughs> And they're all, they're all echoes. They're all echoes of the same debate, the same points on all sides. And it's good. I'm glad that at least we're having the discussion. But what's kind of missing in the debate is the fact that we will never <coughs> feel safe enough. We will never feel secure enough. We won't. There will be those of us who cannot walk down the street for fear that someone might accost us ask us a question or look us in the eye. There are those, you know, if we stop people from what's being defined as aggressive panhandling, which, which is ambiguous enough, none of these, the ones, the things that haven't reached the threshold of crime, but at the same time 
disturb and bother people legitimately. I understand why people are upset by that. But we, if we make these accommodations, this slow boiling of the frog, then we've lost something. We've lost something that actually defines us as a community, where we can disagree, where we can walk in safety, but at the same time walk in the assurance that we are not being observed, not because we're innocent, but because we're people. So I personally would love to see this resolution pass, and I would love to see this rev resolution pass tonight. I'm hearing that it's not going to, but I, if I'm counting the votes, it won't. But I'm very, very grateful for the conversation and the discussion, and I want people to walk away from this, should this fail, and recognize and understand what you're witnessing is good. It is not, it, there was not, there were no clear black and bright, black and white and bright lines. It's the, it's the gray areas where we have the, the struggle. And the fact that we're struggling, I hope, goes to some way to suggest that we're working. We're not, we're, uh, you uh, are not seeing a community that is just rubber stamping uh, with, with, you know, divorce <laughs> from the conversation, divorce from the community input, and divorce from the issues that are there. And each one of these people actually are good people with integrity. Councillor O'Donnell, you had your hand up, and then Councillor Murphy. Thank you. Um, relative to future research, um, I'd like to make a philosophical point that I hope anyone in the council or the public or in the executive keeps in mind as I do future research. And then i like to suggest an item for anyone's reading list. Um, first is there's a question of what is legally permissible versus what is morally right. And the Supreme, please, please, please. The Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, if it, um, or whatever judicial body made the judgment about privacy, um, is the legality of it quite different from what we should do in Northampton. There's also a question of what's practically effective versus what's morally right. So when I hear that we were going to wait to see if research shows that surveillance is effective at deterring crime, I can tell you something that would be effective at deterring crime, a curfew. I'm not trying to be incendiary. This is a thought experiment. If everyone had to go to their house at 8 p.m., crime would drop, but it's wrong. Um, and so we need to frame that as we do research. But here's some research. This is from the British Home Office. I don't have anything from East Hampton or Belchertown. I have a place, I have something from a country where <laughs> I think they literally spend three pounds on surveillance every minute. This is the United Kingdom. Yeah. And certainly you can find other studies. Um, I believe Councilor Bidwell actually quoted the Swedish National Council for Crime Prevention. Um, so let's go from, from Sweden to Britain. Um, the British Home Office in 2015 studied 14 case studies across the country. And clearly you want to read this study because I wouldn't want to just select one quote and say it represents the entire complex picture. It doesn't. You see different variations based on where you are in the country. But I will read one conclusion, which was the quote, the belief that closed circuit television alone can counter complex social problems is unrealistic in the extreme. This is a country that spends enormous amount of money on surveillance and their home office, which is like, um, you know, the cabinet level department that would study, in this case, urban issues like surveillance, um, has, has really in fact shown that there is no conclusive evidence. So I don't expect you to take my word for that tonight. But I do think it's important for us to go back and, and do that research, as I would before voting on anyone else's resolution. Um, but as we do that, let's keep in mind our principles too, not what's just legal or practical or effective, but what's right. And I, I have no doubt this council uh, agrees with that sentiment. Uh, Councilman. Yeah. Um, I, I want to take issue with the word fail, because I am going to make the motion to refer. And if we refer it, it does not mean it fails. It means we're continuing the discussion. I have 
percent belief that the resolution and the ordinance will come back here in more acceptable form after we do our normal process on it. So I don't want to say that if it gets referred tonight, it is in any way failed. It just continues for further discussion and more enlightenment to return perhaps a better and more agreeable product. So I'm going to now move that we refer the resolution to um, the Legislative Matters Committee and Community Resources. Uh, city, city Services. Service. So, there's a motion to a second. 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 To the motion for referral, actually. Uh, in discussion on the, on the mo uh, council plan. So just a point of clarification. So if we vote against this because we feel someone feels like it should be voted on tonight, it, I mean, is that what that vote yes, would if, be Yes, if, if, if the motion to refer fails, then we're back to the original motion. <laughs> Question: If 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 we were to refer this resolution to to, to committees, uh, kind of in parallel with the ordinance, um, would we see that as precluding the possibility of engaging in a parallel an, another process, the process that in fact the police chief and the mayor have invited us to participate in, which is a a, a broad-based committee? Um, do we do we expect to have the bandwidth, or is it wise to be doing both, or do we do, or, or do we want to have one forum that's more inclusive than than a council forum would be, where we where where we continue this discussion? Right. No, it doesn't preclude or exclude the prospect or possibility in any case, whether mm -hmm. it passes, fails, or you know this motion passes or fails, or the original motion passes or fails, still doesn't preclude or exclude any process that is a public process uh, and private process of researching and understanding. So to that end, no, it's not, it's not perverted in any way. Council O'Donnell and Council Carney. Briefly, I've stated my reasons. I'm against delaying this tonight, including the referral. And I'm also against abdicating our responsibility as a legislative body of the city in, in deference to the executive, who I trust and like. But we need to show legislative leadership and for us to not even be involved and say we're going to be involved in a different committee, um, I oppose that in the strongest possible terms with all due respect. It's not how we should make policy. And Council um, a, a process question, I guess, as the chair of uh, uh, City Services Committee, <coughs> um, to which the ordinance, is the ordinance is proposed to be referred and we're talking now about this resolution being referred as well. So my, I guess my question would be, what would be the will of the council to have in turn, it sounds like there's the need for a public forum um, in any event, and should that happen in the city services or should that happen, it's gonna go both because it's an order, it's gonna go to legislative matters mm -hmm. in addition to city services. Well, so it's I, difficult to say because it's presuming a vote. So I don't wanna, I don't wanna presume the outcome of a vote. But it, it, let's speak of this hypothetically, that yes, I mean, I, as I said, I mean. Um, well, uh, I'm assuming there's a, right, it's presuming because we also have, we also have the matter of the uh, order on the, on the agenda that says on the agenda that it's to be referred to, uh, right. that to is those committees. That is, except for referral, right now we're discussing this referral. <coughs> uh, how, th I, 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 it does not preclude a parallel uh, we, uh, uh, depending on the outcome of the vote, um, I could have a conference with uh, Council O'Donnell and even even create an ad hoc committee. That we felt that was mm -hmm. But that depends on uh, again the outcome of the referral vote. And at the same time, uh, the mayor and the executive branch, will, um, have, they've already expressed that they're interested in pursuing um, more expansive public conversations. Mm -hmm. We are, we are not exempt from uh, participating. The, of course, we'll have to figure that out as it becomes open meeting law issues and figure out how we can make that work, but we can make that work. We've done it before, so we can do that. Uh, Roll to uh, affordable housing, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, and the development that uh, won't be there. <laughs> yes. um, if I can recall in the Social Services and Veterans Affairs, 
we did have a public hearing here in Northampton and we had one up in Florence on the benches. So if that came to city service, both of them, you can have an open public hearing. But and in any one of the committees, you could actually have an open public hearing. So to the point of referral, which, which by the way is what's on the floor, um, we can determine after the fact if that were to pass. Right. But let's discuss the issue of referral. Uh, anyone, else, any other point on the on the referral, Council Murphy? No, uh, just con wait, actually, Council Nash. I'm sure. <coughs> I just, I, I'm liking this idea because what I've seen it, it happen several times on my time on council over the last year is that when we get a discussion going to change policy, to change goals for the city, the executive for the city and policy seems to change. <coughs> and that we come together at a kumbaya moment mm -hmm. um, and um, so I'm, I'm liking this idea. Okay, just to be clear. This is not a policy, okay. just to be clear. I'm just, but I'm yes, saying that this conversation, <laughs> all to, all right. and I would like to uh, take deference with uh, uh, Councilor O'Donnell. By referring this, we're not abdicating our legislative responsibility. We're honoring our legislative process to fully air this. So we're, we're, we're doing what we're supposed to be here to do, which is to vet things. We're not passing on the opportunity. We're following the process. I, I, you, you're, correct you're, the record. You're allowed to respond? Correct. I, wanna, I wanna stay on the point of referral, but. Right. Yeah, but just to correct the record, I was reacting to the concept of taking this out of the council and having the debate only in a, a committee set up by the mayor and the chief of police. Right. I also oppose referral because we need to take a stand on this issue. So the debate on referral, <laughs> safe to assume this is over? I'm going to ask for a roll call vote on this. So this is to refer to uh, Committee on City Services and uh, the Committee of Legislative Matters this resolution. I thought it was three. Excuse me? There's a third one? That's what I thought. Is there another yes. committee? Just the two. Yeah. Councillor Bidwell. No. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. No. Councillor Klein? No. Councillor Labarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? No. Councillor Shara? Yes. No, five yes. Five yes. Uh, it is referred to committee and will be uh, now, Councillor. <laughs> okay, Seth, now that this is referred to committee, I think it would be appropriate, given that that date is coming up, that our next committee on city services is on October 2nd. And what um, I guess I would uh, try to ask at this point, if it's appropriate, my other, the other members of that committee, if it would be appropriate for us to um, reserve that meeting for this particular, uh, assuming that also the ordinance will be referred, that both will be referred, that then we uh, put that out there for public input, but also ask for the uh, chief to be present or the mayor or, and also uh, I know that Councillor O'Donnell is one of the uh, um, writers of the resolution, so you could speak to that. Um, and all, all members of the council would be welcome to come and participate. And members of the public, please. Uh, Councillor O'Donnell. Just for the chair of the committee. Would it be appropriate to consider the time of the meeting? Usually they're at 5 o'clock. Mm -hmm. And if we're seeking to maximize public input, as Councilor Murphy suggested, Later. you did too. Maybe it's something we could consider. Yes, and I think it would be appropriate to have it be um, televised. I'm not really sure what the process I, is. I can't dictate that, but yes, yeah, so it would be recorded. <laughs> I'm sorry. What's It'll the process be recorded, for but We could have it, tele uh, we could ask NCTV if they would be prepared to. And you have the, that information, who to ask and how to yep. try to do that? Yep. We'll add, okay. we'll, Jen can pass. Jen's listening to us now, I think, and she can pass <coughs> it on to uh, Al Williams. Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bart. Yes. Councillor Carney, our, on October 2nd, we start at 4 o'clock, and are you talking about um, bringing in the resolution and the ordinance at 5? 
because no, you have appointments also coming in. No, I think that um, Councillor O'Donnell was the time is usually at four, but I think what we should talk about is changing the time for the October 2nd meeting to be a 7 p.m. meeting that would accommodate members of the public. Um, and then I think we'll, we also had planned to speak with uh, fire rescue and EMS, and I think we'll see about postponing that. But you have appointments coming in also. Right, and, and then we'll deal with the, um, the half dozen or more, I think 10 or so appointments that are also coming up. We do need to, we do need to take care of the appointments. Yes, because, because you right? have what, how many? Four plus tonight, some more, so you have I think like eight? Yeah, right, right. Can so I, I would, can we have it like at 6.30 or something like that so we can get the... You know what, I, yeah. I, I, think, I think this is something we can work out of committee because right now we need to move on. Okay. We've only done okay. one agenda item. All right. <laughs> I, I make a suggestion. <laughs> well, that's what a debate's all yeah. about. Mr. President, I'd like to suggest that we take the ordinance that's on the same subject out Thank of order. You. Just refer that so it's done. Then I'd like to request a recess. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, is everyone okay with that? Mm -hmm. Yes. Moving that order up. 17397. Yep. So this is item F on page 5. It's item 17397. This is an ordinance establishing restrictions on the use of surveillance technology in public. It's to refer to the Committee on City Services and the Committee on Legislative Matters. Move to refer. Motion Second. Made and seconded. Discussion on the referral. Councilor uh, Bidwell. Uh, motion and second, actually, with Councilor Murphy. Okay. Councilor Bidwell. Um, I'll vote against even even referring it because I think it's 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 impulsive, it's reflexive, it's not thoughtful. It it does it to to to, to at this stage of the community discussion already have a draft ordinance. I think it's among other things disrespectful of our police chief and the process that she wants to uh, continue, including in partnership with us. If any of us would be willing to do so, and I certainly would. I think to, to even be considering an ordinance at this stage is premature. I think the conversation should continue, the fact gathering should continue, the weighing of pros and cons should continue, and then, based on all that, start all over again if indeed an ordinance is appropriate. So I will be voting against even referral. Um, Councilor Dunn. Uh, the rules of the City Council, which were adopted mm -hmm. unanimously uh, by the City Council, require referral for all ordinances. Any councilor is certainly empowered to vote no, but I've never seen that done. Maybe. Not once. Four years in the council and as an observer before that. Um, and I also think, just as a guideline, let's question each other's facts. Let's have more debate. But let's not question each other's intentions to disrespect people or be impulsive. Let's debate this. And that's what we can do. This has to go to committee. This is not an option. We couldn't pass this tonight if we wanted to. Mm -hmm. So I say let's debate it. I'm in favor of debating this. Any more discussion on referral? Um, all those in favor of referring, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Opposed. Any abstentions? Okay. Um, there's been a request for recess, so we will break for, well, just under nine minutes.
Welcome back. We're coming out of recess and get back to the regular agenda, which puts us on item item number two. <laughs> the consent agenda. Uh, I'm going to ask that we remove item 17.365 uh, in that we didn't get to have the um, hearing for the poll petition. So, um, so absent that, we have item 17, uh, this is the consent agenda, 17.395. 17 this is appointments to various committees. This is to refer to the Committee on City Services, which is going to have a very full agenda. The Council on Aging, Casey Fowler of 91 West Hampton Road in Florence, is term to start uh, September 2017, expiring June 2020, and then fill a vacancy. Transportation Parking Commission, uh, Benjamin Albert Fisher at 50 Ma uh, Manhattan Street in Northampton, term to start June <coughs> 17, uh, 17, expiring June 2020. It's a reappointment. The Arts Council, <coughs> Alan Schneider of 231 Main Street in Leeds, is a term to start September 2017 uh, and expiring June 2020. This is to fill a vacancy. And then also to approve the minutes uh, of September 7, 2017, City Council meeting. Move to approve. Second. Motion's made and seconded to approve the consent agenda as amended. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? <coughs> okay. Mr. President? Yes. Could we consider moving up the taxi ordinance since I see there's one person waiting and has waited for yep. hours? Yep. Yep. Let's, let's scroll all the way down to your... <laughs> to your ordinances, uh, but do 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 do, and that's item seventeen point two six five. This is um, an ordinance relative to taxis and vehicles for hire, and this would be a first reading. Comes with a positive recommendation on the from the committee on legislative matters, uh, September eleventh, uh, twenty seventeen. I move we refer to legislative matters because of uh, comments from the sealer of weights and measures. Second. Motions made and seconded to refer back to legislative matters for more uh, review. Any discussion on that referral? Questions? All those in favor of referring this back, we're going to, we're, we're putting John through his paces here. He's doing us a favor and we're beating the bejesus out of him. But so, okay. All those in favor of referring, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Jeff, so this will go back to legislative matters for you to be able to uh, give testimony there. Okay? It get you out of the building here. So, okay? All right. All right, let's scroll back to the third item that we had on here. Um, oh, look. We're going to recess again. But this time <laughs> we're recessing for the Finance Committee, which was chaired by Councilor Murphy. And, Councilor Murphy, you have the floor. Uh, thank you. I'll call a meeting to order and ask John to call the roll of finance. Councillor Murphy. I'm in fact here. Councillor Carney. Present. Councillor LaBarge. Present. Councillor Nash. Here. Thank you. First order of business is approve the minutes of September 7th. Do we have a motion? Second. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, the first of our orders is 17391. It's an order to authorize a taking by eminent domain of a parcel of property identified as Assessor's Map 32C, Parcel 348. Order that whereas the City and Columbia Gas have negotiated a settlement relative to the disposal site known as the former Northampton Gas Works, um, in order to achieve a permanent solution within the meaning of uh, 310 CMR 40.006 and 40.1000, and whereas in order to achieve a permanent solution, each of the contaminated parcels within the site must be encumbered by an activity and use limitation in accordance with Mass General Law uh, 21E subsection 6 and 310 CMR uh, 40.0000 and whereas parcel A shown on the plan entitled taking plan plan of land in Northampton Mass Hampshire registry prepared for Woodward and Kern by Northeast Survey Consultants dated September 14th 2017 assessors map 32C parcel 348 was formerly the riverbed of the Mill River uh, as to which the ownership is uncertain and whereas in an order to encumber parcel A uh, 
with a um, use limitation, the city agreed to acquire a record title there too, and whereas Columbia Gas has agreed to indemnify the city as to any legal costs and as to any response costs associated with Parcel A, and whereas no appropriation is needed to fund this taking in as much as the locust is a disposal site as defined by Mass General Law 21E. Now, therefore, it be ordered that the city hereby, the city council hereby authorizes the taking by eminent domain in accordance with Mass General Law uh, Section 79, Parcel A, shown on a plan entitled Taking Plan, Plan of Land in Northampton, Hampshire County Registry, prepared for Woodward and Curran by Northeast Survey Consultants, dated September 14, 2017, Assessor's Map 32C, Parcel 348, in fee simple absolute. The purpose of the taking authorized here under is to facilitate the execution or recording of an activity use limitation thereon in accordance with Mass General Law 21E subsection 6 and 310 CMR 40 uh, in order to achieve a permanent solution within the meaning of 310 CMR 40 and 40.1. Do we have a motion put on the floor? Make a motion put on the floor. Second. And the mayor is here to explain what we're doing by the taking. Yeah, so um, several years ago, the city and Columbia Gas uh, reached a legal settlement um, regarding the uh, former gas works, um, which for those of you uh, not familiar with the, where the roundhouse lot is, um, but not only the roundhouse lot, but also the, um, the contamination from its former days as a gasification plant extend over to where the, um, uh, where the Maplewood shop, shop lots are. It also, there's some private properties involved. Um, and so uh, Columbia Gas, as the successor owner of the uh, former gas works, has been working uh, with both you know, the city as well as private owners um, to basically uh, put these AULs in place, um, which basically uh, are put on the deed of the property and stay with the property in perpetuity, which basically say, you know, these are the things you can and can't do on the property. Um, we did um, negotiate and have in place AULs on the roundhouse lot, um, which delineate the areas that have been cleaned up, um, you know, areas where there's, you know, you can only go to certain levels, what you can do there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is actually one part of that 21 East site, which is an owner unknown property. It's basically the sort of the no man's land of what was the former Mill River bed, which is an owner unknown property. Um, the problem with an AUL is that you can't put an AUL <laughs> on, a pro on a property without sort of the consent of the owner. And since there's no owner, um, what, what Columbia Gas would like the city to do is to basically take it, um, take ownership of it, um, and then they will immediately, will, will immediately put an AUL on it um, and as you can see, uh, Columbia Gas will fully indemnify the city um, against, you know, any of the issues related to uh, the 21E site. Um, and, you know, they are the responsible party anyway, so they'd be held responsible, but they'll indemnify us against any potential legal claims. It's sort of like, sort of like the f one of the final puzzle piece which can never be put in place um, without an owner. Um, and there is no owner, so, uh, so we're, we're going to take it uh, become the owner. So you're basically being asked to take this owner unknown parcel um, with all the stipulations that are in the um, order. And if you uh, vote, you know, on second reading, you'll have a, a taking order that you'll be asked to sign similar to the one that you did a couple of weeks ago that's actually included in your packet as a sample um, on second reading. So that's the backstory. Um, and uh, if there's any questions, I can try to answer them. Any questions for the mayor on this one? No? Uh, then hearing no questions, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Great. The next is 17 to 392 in order to authorize reprogramming of funds to uh, the fire station project, order that $2,000 of the remaining balance <coughs> in the fire department fuel dispensing system project be reprogrammed to provide for the installation of reinforced glass in the fire station lobby. Do we have a motion on this? Make a motion. Second. Second. Questions? The mayor can explain this one. This is just uh, there is a project that they finished uh, the upgrades to their fuel uh, to station, and um, again, you've noticed uh, you'll see some other orders. Um, you know, some of the original components of the uh, of the station 
uh, when it was built, they're doing some upgrades to carpeting, you know, alerting system, et cetera. This is sort of more of a security issue. The, the, when the original, you know, glass was installed, when you go into that main lobby, which is kind of a secure area, there's security to get into the main fire station, security to get into the, to the administrative offices. Um, there's, you know, reinforced doors, but the actual glass in the lobby is not reinforced glass in any way, and they'd like to upgrade it to a, a reinforced glass for safety and security. So that's mm -hmm. the that's the purpose of the project. And again, these were funds that were allocated to another project, so just reassigning funds is not... Yes, they are basically the residual of, of a capital project that you already approved at the fire rescue department, and they want it, they're asking permission to reprogram it to this other project. Okay. Any other questions in finance? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation? Aye. 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 Opposed? The next is 17393 in order to appropriate funds to pay for carpeting at the fire station. Order that $9,685 be appropriated from the fire department gift fund to pay for replacement of carpeting in the main fire station. Do we have a motion? I make a motion. Second. All right. Uh, On that same theme, uh, this is carpeting that was installed like 15 years ago. Um, it's a little uh, worn and a little long in the tooth, and they would like to replace it. Um, and they have received they receive gifts over time from 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 people, uh, you know, great folks that are grateful to them for one reason or, or another for the service they provide. And so they would like permission to use this uh, nine thousand plus dollars from their gift fund and to be able to put it into uh, new carpet for the station. Any other questions for the mayor on this one? Uh, hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation of finance, please say aye. 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 Opposed? And the last one is 17394, in order to authorize the payment of a prior year bill. Uh, be it ordered that the council authorizes payment of a prior fiscal year bill from 2017, totaling $814.38, to National Grid related to the traffic signal at Damon Road and Industrial Drive. Do we have a motion? Make a motion. Second? Um, Pretty self-explanatory. Yeah, this was actually a billing error when they put the new light up at Damon Road and Industrial Drive. I think for, I believe they may have sent the bill to MassDOT, the electric bill, and so it didn't actually get to us. We're the ones responsible for paying the electric bill. So the bill got lost in the mail. MassDOT uh, didn't pay it, huh? Uh, apparently, no, they were not <laughs> willing to, to pay that for us. So it, when it finally arrived to us, it was obviously past the end of the fiscal year. So we want to make, we've straightened it out now. The billing is set up correctly, but because we're in a new fiscal year, we need permission to pay it for, mm -hmm. from a previous fiscal year. Right. Any other questions for the mayor? Hearing none, all in favor of a positive recommendation in finance, please say aye. 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 Um, the only uh, announcement I'd like to make is that um, the finance meeting, our off meeting on, on Tuesday at the end of the month is not necessary and it'll show up being canceled probably tomorrow in the email. But uh, Susan, does, Susan doesn't need it for anything and there's nothing else on our agenda so we'll cancel it and you'll get an email about that. Uh, motion to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. <coughs> okay, thank you. We come out of recess and we're going to address those very same financial orders. Um, <clears throat> back to item 17.392. This is an order to authorize reprogramming of funds to the fire station project. First reading. Approved. Seconded. Seconded. Councilor O'Donnell. Uh, further discussion on this? Roll call, please. Uh, Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidlow. Yes. That passes <coughs> in first reading. We'll revisit that at our next meeting. Yeah, the first in October, the first meeting in October. Item 17.393 this is in order to appropriate funds to pay for carpeting at the fire station. First Motion reading. Approved. Motions made and seconded. Discussion? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shaw. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. All right. It passes in first reading. Item 17.394 this is an order to authorize payment of a prior year bill. Move to approve. Second. Further discussion? Roll call, please, John. 
Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Zabar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. That passes in first reading. Item 17.386 is in order to approve the expenditure the expenditure of up to five thousand dollars per year in gifts funds is second reading. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Further discussion? <coughs> Roll call, please. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. All right. That passes in second reading. <laughs> Item 17.387 is in order to approve the acceptance of gifts of tangible per, uh, personal property of $5,000 so in second reading. Second. Motion's made and second. Who made the motion originally? Uh, Councilor LaBarge. Okay. Discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. All right, that passes in second reading. Also in second reading, item 17.388, uh, this is in order to approve reprogramming funds totaling $17,361 to Can central services. Approve? Second. Motion's made and seconded. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Barge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. All right. This is in second reading. Also in second reading, item 17.389 uh, is in order to authorize a payment of a prior year bill. Move to approve. In the second aid. Discussion? Roll call. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Shara? Yes. Councilor Bidwell? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor LaBarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor Nash? Yes. Okay, <clears throat> we come to the orders, and the first one is item 17.391. This is an order of taking. To authorize the taking by eminent domain of parcel property identified on the assessor's map 32C, parcel 348, is first reading. Moved to approve. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Um, we do have that signature sheet on this one, but that doesn't come into play until after second, second reading. Second reading. So just so if, if everyone has their pen queued up, don't sign it. Okay. <laughs> uh, <coughs> uh, discussion on this item? Roll call, John. Councillor Shara? Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor LaBarge? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Okay. Passes in first reading. That will be come up again in our first meeting in October. Item 17.382. This is a warrant for November 7th, 2017 election. Second reading. Move to approve. Second. Motion's made and seconded. Anyone want to have an election? Okay, mm -hmm. seems reasonable. Any other discussion? Roll call, please. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Bard? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. Councillor Nash? Yes. Councillor O'Donnell? Yes. Councillor Shara? Yes. Okay. We'll, we will have an election was November 7th, 2017, for folks who are not paying attention. Be there. Be there. <laughs> Item 17.384 is in order to accept a parklet. From the owner of the roundhouse. Move to approve. Second. Motion's made and seconded. This is second reading. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Barge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor Nash. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Bidwell. Yes. Okay, that passes in second reading. We've already done the first <coughs> ordinance. So we move on to uh, item 17.348. This is an ordinance to clarify parking lot design criteria when installing photovoltaic canopies over surface parking lots. First reading. Move to approve. Second. 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 Uh, Carolyn Mish is here. And uh, to, to speak to these items, do you want to take these all separately? <coughs> or would you like to have? Move as a group. You want to move them as a group? Yes. Second that. They have little wrinkles in them. I'm not sure that would be the best. Okay. So the, this, it, it, actually, that's a good point. Uh, we have a neutral recommendation from legislative matters on this one. 
uh, neutral recommendations on all of them. So it's probably best to take them one at a time. We also have a member of the public who wants to speak. Yeah. Yep, yeah, and we also have someone from the public who wants to speak at this point too. So, <coughs> excuse me. So we'll start with the first one, and here we are. In the year 2017, upon the recommendation of the mayor and the Office of Planning and Sustainability, this is an ordinance to clarify parking lot design criteria when installing photovoltaic canopies over surface parking lots. Uh, an ordinance of the city of Northampton. Uh, I'll spare you all this. Uh, Section 1, uh, Chapter 350, Subsection 8.9F. Uh, this is in surface parking lots um, with uh, more than 75 parking spaces. The expansive pavement shall be, there's two commas here, that's helpful. The expansive pavement shall be interrupted by separating rows of parking spaces from each other and from driveways by using planting strips, which may also contain pedestrian sidewalks at least six feet in width. Provision of these planting strips shall take into account the need to store snow, to locate light poles, to allow safe pedestrian movement, to maximize emergency access, and to separate different traffic movements. <coughs> in addition, if an existing parking lot is expanded to over 75 spaces, planting strips shall be required for the entire lot. All proposals to construct or modify such parking lots shall be reviewed by the planning board in light of the requirements of this section. The calculation for determining whether the planting strips are required does not apply to the portion and number of parking spaces that are covered by one or more uh, photovoltaic canopies. And then uh, subsection 8.9H, this is the surface parking lots with over 15 parking spaces serving uh, uses located in business, industrial, and business park or planned village districts must have at least one shade tree, a minimum of two inch caliper, for every 15 parking, uh, provided parking spaces. The number of trees per parking spaces is required for all spaces that are not covered by the photovoltaic canopies. Uh, so we did move that. And then, uh, do you want to? Or would you like to sure, sure, Carolyn, I'm sure people have questions for her, but the actual gist of this is that when, when the property owner who's proposing the change puts in photovoltaic, that they would get to modify the total tree count out of respect for the fact that some of the places the trees would go are covered with photovoltaic panels. And uh, that's the gist of it. So it's changing it changing the calculation of the number of trees to respect the fact that if these planting strips in fact are covered by photo photovoltaic stuff that you can't put a tree there anymore so they can change the tree count in favor of the photovoltaic panels and I think Carol that's a gist of it but I'm sure Carolyn could answer any more questions so the gist of this is to incentivize the establishment of photovoltaic systems and you're providing an offset from the uh, trees of a certain caliper to be planted on these strips Right, carrot versus stick. Is that it? Right. I mean, it's not. It, I, I should say it, it's an incentive. Yes, for um, um, for installing canopies. I also want to clarify that um, the planning board voted to um, recommend that this that this set of ordinances not be adopted. Um, for the tr for the for this incentive because they felt that the trees should still be part of the calculation and um, be planted elsewhere even though they couldn't be where the canopies would be located miss uh, miss all three ordinances were this these were two sections subsections of this ordinance. subsections in this oh one. the two these two yeah but the, you know, for H eight eight um, three four eight yeah F and H. Yeah. Um, Council Murphy, you want to speak to the neutral recommendation? Um, we we basically came up with a neutral recommendation in deference to the planning board. Um, they 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 chose not to uh, be positive about this, so we sort of just passed on the fact that you know we didn't want to positively recommend something they didn't recommend. Obviously there's an, an advantage to PV and advantage to trees. You know, both of them are nice things to have. And this comes up in site plan review, I assume, when they're doing <laughs> projects, that, that 
I imagine in some cases there would be other places to put the trees, and some places there may not be, depending on what the site is like. And and this ordinance, you know, doesn't it doesn't really allow for that consideration. Is there somewhere else to put them? It's just saying that you don't have to put them on on these buffer strips, but in the parking lot, if you don't have to put a tree there, if you put a PV there, because two things can't occupy the same space. So I guess you right. know we can debate. We we figure the debate better happen here. We better not do it just in legislative matters. Uh, just to clear something up, I believe if you're having a site plan review, isn't that what the planning board does? Is determine. Mm -hmm whether to make the accommodations to provide offsets if, the, if it's physically impossible to plant trees or at least an absurd array of trees that the planning board has the authority to grant leniency, is that? Is um, there is a require, I mean, there is some um, flexibility, but this section does require one tree or these combination of sections depending on how large the parking lot is one tree per 15 parking spaces so um, I think there could be flexibility in that um, an applicant could offer to plant trees somewhere else potentially off-site but I think the number of trees if this doesn't pass would still be part of the calculation uh, uh, Council down. This is like the Northampton version of the irresistible force meeting the immovable object. <laughs> Solar panels versus trees. I think it's like uh, a major cataclysm for us. So I just want to understand how much of a practical incentive, I may have asked this in the committee, but I don't really remember if I did. Um, how much of an incentive is this? Is it substantial? Can you imagine this being a very substantial incentive for photovoltaic, or is it unclear? Um. I think it's probably um, hard to quantify. Um, you know, we just approved our first canopy um, in the city over parking lot that's you know on private property, um, and it's a small system. Um, in that case, the trees are all located on the exterior of the lot, but it's a smaller lot. So um, I think the idea is just to show that the city um, you know, would encourage canopies, and so, d you, you know, um, the idea would be that um, we do understand those trade-offs, and um, especially for large parking lots, um, there's, there's a big benefit to having those covered <coughs> canopies. A follow-up? What, I mean, would it make sense if we, um, allowed for discretion during site plan review? Like, could we just say, unless waived by the planning board? Sure. And so there's a requirement for trees, but it's flexible. It's just not, as this is kind of to the council president's point, it's not automatically flexible. There's some wiggle room built in there. So you can do it, but it's, up, it's, it's situation specific. Yeah, yes. Okay. I mean, the, the, you know, this reminds me of when, um, we did the King Street zoning some years back and we were incentivizing building up to the street. We offer a, re a reduction in, in green space requirements. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and this seems to have a similar flavor to it. And it seems to me that the planning board is a discretionary board. I mean, they're interpreting law, but of course we help guide them by establishing the law. So I think do you, I don't ask you to speak for the planning board, but what's your sense about Councilor O'Donnell's proposal because if we built in that at least dimension of flexibility, it seems to me that it's open to their interpretation. Yes, I mean, I don't think th there was definitely debate at the planning board about whether this was an appropriate incentive, um, and it came down um, um, in the final vote as um, voting against, you know, just automatically allowing that. Um, but I think t if I, you know, if I'm thinking back to um, planning board's proposals for other ordinance changes and the and some of the allowances in the zoning now that allow them to um, look at um, situations specifically, that that makes sense and they've d they've used their discretion over and over again in that scenario. So I don't think that would be an issue at all. 
So if we were to vote for this in first reading, would it be possible to bring back amended language for second reading that said sure. something like the planning board may waive yep. in favor of so that they, they have the option by plan and circumstance to say, you know, yeah, there's nowhere to put the trees, we'll, we'll waive them or gee, we'd like you to put the extra trees over here on the site and leave the option to them to do it or not. Right. Yeah. And in fact, that mirrors the language that's in um, other the section. other proposal. Yeah. Um, proposal that's in front of you and, and to give them the opportunity for offsets in, on different properties to establish mm -hmm. um, yeah. trees. Um, Councilor Klein. Um, <clears throat> Carolyn, can you tell us what the vote, do you remember how the vote came down exactly? I can pull it up on my phone, but I don't <laughs> remember it off the top of my head. Um, I think there was discussion and then I think people were swayed to another vote. So it wasn't completely divided, you know, just with a simple um, majority. But um, I think um, the people who, folks who wanted to vote against it sort of brought others over with them in the end, after, you know, after discussion. But I don't remember the number. Councilor Murphy. Given the discussion there, would, would they be happy with our giving them the flexibility to waive under circumstances, some circumstances and not under, would that satisfy their concern that so. it was all or nothing, that they, they right. may waive if circumstances justify it and right. not if others? I, I think so, and just again, as I said, in the next ordinance um, down the page a bit, um, you know, that provision was in the language and they were fine with that. Um, and in fact, they debated that ordinance as well, which we can talk about, but, they liked the fact that they had the flexibility to sort of consider, you know, specific circ circumstances. So we, yeah, council. Can can we just fix it right now? Can we just add, the planning board may determine that, before each sentence. We can. Yes. I'd rather we, just. <coughs> we can amend it. Then vote on something that, yeah. Yeah, we just don't have the language on it. Right. Um, yeah, the, the, yeah, it would be probably wise to add it through the solicitor of the amended language, but. And have it next time. If, Let's delay it and do two readings next meeting, rather than vote on something that we don't really agree with. Okay. It's kind of equivalent, but whatever the preference of the council. Uh, so that's a motion? Yeah, move to continue. The, uh, second on the motion to continue. Any discussion on the motion to continue? We're doing a lot of that tonight. Okay. All those in favor of continuing, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. So it's a continue with the understanding that uh, some flexibility language will be built in that that uh, passes the uh, planning board smell test. All right. Um, now we're up to, <coughs> excuse me, item 17.349. <coughs> this is an ordinance to allow small scale ground mounted photovoltaic arrays on in the floodplain. This is the first reading. And here it is. This is upon the recommendation of the mayor and the Office of Plan Planning and Sustainability. Um, this is an ordinance uh, being ordained by the city council, the section one. Expand the uses uh, provisions allowed by special permit as follows. Special permit approved required for the following uses by the planning board unless otherwise noted. Accessory solar uh, photovoltaic ground mounted on a parcel with any building or use between eight kilowatts or over 100%, but no more than 200% of the annual projected electrical, uh, electric use of the non-PV building or use. Add to that uh, solar uh, photovoltaic PV, non-accessory ground mounted only when the following conditions exist. First, the location of the system has not been in agricultural production for at least 25 years. And the location is over uh, soils that are not considered prime agricultural soils as listed by the NRCS and the Department of Agricultural Resources. And that the panels are located within 100 feet of a power line and or pole and that the system will not exceed eight kilowatts. Is there a motion? Move to move. Move to second. second. Okay. Discussion on this item, and, and Wayne, I suspect this is the one you want to speak to? Okay. Okay. So we'll hear from Carolyn first, and then um, we'll, I'll ask for a vote to recognize Wayne. Okay. Well, hang on a second. Carolyn, it's all yours. <laughs> 
Um, so the provision was put forward um, to take another step towards allowing um, installations, ground-mounted installations in the floodplain, which have been fairly restrictive up to this point for the purposes of protecting farmland. Um, so when back in 2011, when the um, our initial package of ordinances were proposed and adopted by the city council to um, specify parameters for installations of both rooftop systems as well as ground-mounted systems, um, there was a specific um, um, there was we carved out the special conservancy zone, the floodplain, which has prime agricultural, because of the concern about losing that. Um, those agricultural resources in the city. So there, um, since then, um, there's been an interest in thinking about maybe adding up the opportunity for, and these are non-accessory systems, so not associated with a use that's there, but just taking a piece of property and installing a ground mount system. So this is, a, this is one of those incremental steps to test it, to see if it makes sense just the small step, or maybe in the future we might think about um, broadening the language to allow more installations, but still with a concern and and um, um, idea that we don't want to turn all the or allow all the um, properties uh, that are prime agricultural to be turned over. So there are four bullets in this provision. It's still a special permit. Proposes special permit. Um, as the discussion went through, and I think you see here that this was a, also a neutral recommendation from um, Legislative Matters Committee, but um, when this went to the planning board, the planning board debated this one and felt that um, there were some overlapping, that there were the bullets um, basically addressed all the same issues and, and there was no need to have um, all four criteria met. And so they voted to recommend just the last two bullet items to be adopted in the ordinance, which would be to ensure that the panels weren't located within 100 feet of a, uh, that were <coughs> located within 100 feet of a power line, power or pole, and that the system not exceed 8 kW. That that, those two in itself would limit the total area that could be converted um, for this use. And I'm sorry, so, so they were, suggesting that uh, the agricultural production in 25 years, the, the legacy issues would be moot or they're already embedded in the protections that exist now and that? Um, they felt that that was onerous and they felt that um, by limiting the total size, you're not going to have a huge amount of farmland convert anyway. Right, so the so available inventory Right. It would be limited enough by the 100 feet right. access, the 100 foot access to a power line. Right. Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Um, but why, why, why was there uh, the, the emphasis on, on prime soils eliminated? Not, not, not all soils within 100 feet of a power line are the same. No. And, and the original impetus was to, was to be sure that the, the, those very best soils are still available for agriculture. So why, why did they want to waive that? Um, so I, there was a debate about whether that, I guess there may have been a misunderstanding that that's, a, that's an actual term, it's a technical <laughs> um, term, and that um, there was a concern that that would be too, um, uh, the language wasn't specific enough to say, well, who's going to determine whether someone could come and argue that their soils aren't prime and, and that therefore that might open up. Um, property anyway, and who's to determine whether it's prime or not, even though there's a standard at the state exactly. and the federal level. Um, in the end, they felt that the final two bullets still addressed the issue, so they didn't, they weren't so concerned about opening up even small amounts of prime agricultural land. Um, Wayne? would like to speak to this point and uh, it would require a recognition from the council. To, uh, I'll accept the move. Recognition of Wayne. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I'll repeat myself too much. I've been working on this for over two years. And basically uh, at that last meeting, uh, uh, the address the first two bullets that were the agricultural land, basically all the land in the meadows 
is agricultural land. There's, there's no stones there. You could grow anything in it. That's, that was one of the discussions why they felt, you know, they probably dropped that, that one bullet. The other one was uh, uh, about, they had a, a last 25 years that it was out of agricultural production. Now the other two, the panels located within 100 feet of a power, power pole and the system shall not exceed AKW. These are added making it more, all four of these are making it more restrictive to put solar down there. The, ori the original, when I filled out an original permit, I was denied because I was not using the electricity there. I couldn't use it for my home. So that's what I, wa I wanted to change because everybody else can do it. So they're gonna make that change but they threw in this, these four extras. Now I'll do a comparison, with sp that's Special Conservancy floodplain. Florence Fields is floodplain, Special Conservancy zoning. They put 88 panels on the roof, not on the ground, but 88 panels on the ground, on the roof. 22 point something KW. The power feed in that building is 250 feet away. The power, it's a three-phase system that goes to the two buildings there, where they put the panels. On the other end of the field, they have their pumps way down towards Look Park, 750 feet away. This 100 feet, and when I, when I brought it up, why does it make any difference? Because it's all underground, nobody sees it. In, in my situation, I have poles going by with power in the road. I already have power down there. I would probably go, have to go up to a, a, a larger electrical service. I'm not sure. But I'm pretty close within that 100 feet, but I may be a little over 100 feet. But it's going to be underground anyways. Nobody's going to see it. I'm not adding power poles. The, po uh, uh, the other thing is uh, all that electricity down there, whereas... Under, under me putting it where I am, I, have to, I had to use it. Florence Fields is all gonna be used throughout the city for all their other fields. They put it on a commercial account to be used for all their fields. The city landfill, supplied throughout the city. Everybody else, 140 homes that solarized solar power, are getting credits because they're selling all that excess power. But it was restricted in that one area. I don't, I, of every place I've been and everybody I've talked to, that, well, there, there's already a, a 50 panel ground mounted down there that was put in last year, I believe. And that's way over 8KW. Now, one of the discussions we had is, is the sizes. Small scale is under 10 kW. In most cases that, I mean, if you're within 8 kW, that's fine for most houses, but if you're a little over, <coughs> uh, like under that 10 kW, because once you go to 10 kW, everything changes, the amount of money you collect for the SRECs and all the rest. In fact, you're gonna see, as of March this year, installations that aren't put in you can see less installations because you're not going to get the money you get for selling those credits. The average system is going to lose $8,000 over a home system less than if they don't get it in by March 15th. So I'm comparing Special Conservancy with Special Conservancy. Why is it right the city can produce all this power, have the power 250 feet away, and then, then say, i got to have it 100 feet away? I don't know why they have that 100 feet because anybody that puts something in or even your homes, you've got to pay all that extra to run that power in. And if it's underground, who's going to see it anyways? Like Florence Fields or where I have power now, I'd run underground because there's no, no rocks down there. It's easy digging. It's, it's the best way to go. Councilor O'Donnell, you have a question? Is yeah, um, Mr. Tebow, as I understand it, you'd be in favor of the ordinance with changes. Because the ordinance would get you 
to what you want to where you want to be except you have <coughs> two problems one is the distance uh, of the power line and <coughs> you're not sure if possibly the distance yes okay yeah, but in most cases I probably would okay well that's a question mark and the other question mark is the size which we measure in kilowatts other than that yeah. it, the ordinance does clarify and address what you're what you're raising as a problem so is that is that correct that those are the two sticking points for you those are the two that are in there yes yeah. okay and, and I and, excuse and, me and speaking about the AKW 8kW mm -hmm. that's that's probably all right I don't I don't understand why you just don't say you know small scale because the other one that's already down there is probably about 14 kW yeah and that I was allowed to go in there uh-huh why was that allowed to go in there? I don't know. You know I don't know either. I can't yeah. get an answer. Well, I mean, what I'd suggest possibly as a solution is um, I, th I think that you probably have desire in the council to to uh, address the situation that, that, that you're in, but I think you also want, um, I think we also need an understanding of, of, of more than just your situation. You know, I think we need to, like, what is a good distance? I, I don't know. Is it 250 feet? Um, so those are questions I just I don't have the answers to, and I would like to just put in the numbers that you that you want, you know, so you can do your project because it seems fine to me, but I, I don't have an understanding of what those numbers are. So the question is, for the council, how would we get those numbers before voting on this? Well, can we hear from Ms. Mish about? Well, so, uh, thank you, Wayne. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, thank you. Carolyn, can you once again we're asking you to divine the thoughts of the planning board and and share them with us. <coughs> the original ordinance was drafted by, sta by us, by staff. Um, and um, the uh, issue about the distance to poles is that we want existing, we want to make sure that these are connected to existing poles so that new poles aren't then that N National Grid isn't going to come and say, well, we have to install a new pole, and then throughout the meadows you start getting new poles. I don't know. Um, so that was the issue. So keep it small. And, and the 8KW is it's a, it's a modest um, start for non-accessory use. So um, yes, it's a small system, but that was purposeful. Um, because this is the first step in, in opening the door um, for systems in the meadows. So um, we do, except for the exceptions that have already been drafted, which are systems oh, at the airport because it's not in agricultural production. So ground-mounted array of um, a larger scale was installed there because originally in 2011, um, um, landfills and airports were essentially treated separately from um, all other properties in the city because we wanted to again create an incentive in areas that um, we as a city were okay with seeing sort of dual purpose um, and then rooftop systems have always since the beginning have either been exempt or are just considered accessory because they're on the roof so it's not um, um, looking at the system at the Florence Fields is is not comparing you know, a similar system to what's being proposed here. Councilor Nash so uh, two questions so and actually if I could ask Wayne real quick and then it, you'll be able to so is, is the pole on your property, or is it 100 feet? Is there a pole at your property? <coughs> no. Is there a pole? There's a pole on the road. Yeah. But it's a, is your property abutting the road? Yes, there's 650 feet on, on the blacktop road. There's a power line down to the last house. And that's into the power line. Okay. So, so the, the goal is not is not to put in, in in any more poles and I would think that maybe if we made the requirement that the property be within a hundred feet of the pole and then once the line is on the property that they if you want to go underground or what you know I mean he, he the idea is that the property owner be able to put the the system in the ideal position on the property and you know so down there 
mounted all with a, with a purpose. <coughs> mounted with a hundred amp service down there. That's mm -hmm. already. But that where I have that power is part way out my field. That is probably a little bit over a hundred feet to where I was going to put the panels off the road. And the poles by the road of where I pick up are so the power is over a hundred feet. The one thing I want to caution us is that we're creating law and zoning not specific to an individual. Right, right. That's I, as close to spot zoning as you could possibly that. get. So <laughs> as, we, as we have this conversation, we're talking about not just Mr. Tebow's concerns, but the concerns of other people with other property. So, uh, I was just going to say, you know, on, along those lines, um, this just to remind that this is a special permit um, process. So, if it um, made sense, um, you could revise this bullet to say that installation um, does not trigger new pole installation. Right, as opposed to saying the hundred feet. Right. That's because that was going to be my question. Does anyone know what? National Grid's pain threshold is for uh, uh, pole construction. Apparently, they don't show up for a petition, so I don't know. They don't see it. But, <coughs> uh, Councilor O'Donnell. I think that's a good solution. Um, I think we should consider doing that. I think we should eliminate the first bullet, and we should pass it on first reading tonight, or vote on it first reading tonight, and if there are further changes, we need to determine them before two weeks, just to move this along. Uh, Councilor Bidwell. Uh, what, what's the Ag Commission have to say about all this? Um, we didn't specifically take this language to the um, Ag Commission as a separate meeting, or um, but I think there's been some discussion that they'd be interested in looking at, you know, small tweaks. When you have a question? I brought it to the Ag Agricultural Commission. Yeah. And they were in favor of what I wanted to do, and also they're in favor of increasing over the AKW, small scale. Now, the last meeting I went was in May, where they, they said they were gonna present it to the planning board. I never got the minutes, and they never produced the minutes, except today when I went online, they got the minutes for when they're going to start again in September. Why they didn't? Why they didn't put those minutes out? But I do bump into one of the uh, agricultural uh, meeting uh, the guys that, that's on the committee, two of them, and uh, they'll they'll vouch exactly what I said that they were going to recommend that to the planning board. Their original intentions were they wanted to keep large scale commercial solar out of the meadows, but they had no problem with uh, small landowners and that putting small facilities in. Um, I don't have a copy of those minutes. Okay. Um, Councilman O'Donnell, you want to put, you want to clarify what your amendment is? I want to do one of two things. This one may not be ready for prime time after all. This may be we want to send it back to legislative matters. So. For amendment. Yeah, I mean, we're, We've not, we've, you know, it's, co it's a complex ordinance. So I'd like to do that, or I'd like to move forward with Carolyn's suggestion. I defer to the council. Uh, okay, so I, I'm not hearing a motion, I'm hearing an option. Um, is, yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. Is there, uh, so I will. Uh, okay, I have a question. <clears throat> sure. This will answer it. Um, Carolyn. If, if we send it back to committee, does it trigger, like, does it have to go back to the planning board again? Have we passed the, the window? Do we have time? To um, yeah, so there's a there's a 90 day time uh -huh. a clock that um, starts when the legislative matters closed the hearing. So that was just last week. So you're you still have some time. Um, you don't necessarily have to. Um, it depends on the changes. I mean, we'd probably want to re-advertise it, and there's time to between now and your um, October meeting anyway. We'd probably want to advertise it, uh, re-advertise it, just because there may be significant enough changes to warrant that. 
um, which is no problem. There's plenty of time to do that. And that's, what, three weeks away, so that's within the 90 days, and then you could turn it back to. Absolutely. And, and that would be preferable to me to do it again, because if we just modify it here and we do exceed the threshold of what would have required a hearing, then we're going to get in trouble that way. Uh, and if we do, um, and, and please note, we have to set legislative matters in, uh, in October because it lands on a holiday. It's normal day. So make sure we pick, let you know what day it's going to be before you advertise. But if the planning, if you could run our thoughts by the planning board, maybe they could weigh in on it for the public hearing and, and have some input as to the new language when we do it the next time. And that way we won't run afoul of having done a public hearing on something we changed too much subsequently. So, so I'm, I move to commit this to legislative matters. I second that. Okay. We have a motion. Any discussion on the motion? This is a motion to refer back to legislative matters. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 <clears throat> Opposed? Okay. A lot of punting tonight. Um, <clears throat> item 17.350, this is an ordinance to change the site plan section 350, <coughs> subsection 11.6 to require new construction of a certain size to be solar ready. Um, this is a neutral recommendation from the uh, legislative matters. The motion is made. There's a second. Uh, discussion. Uh, Council Murphy, can you speak to the neutral recommendation on this one? Um, that's probably my response my responsibility because um, I was concerned about it talked about one of the things that could happen to be solar ready was in site plan review the planning board moving the building around so that the roof was oriented better for solar and my concern was if there was another thing that they'd set the building for like a view or something like that that having the planning board say, well, the hell with your view, we want it over here so that it's ready for maybe solar that isn't even on it yet, that there would be some issue with that. Um, so that's why, the, it, as a result of that discussion, it came with a neutral. So, in my, uh, thank you. In my bad, I didn't, I didn't actually read it yet. So I didn't read aloud. So for, for the record, this is uh, to add a new subsection. This is 11.6F. Uh, in parentheses, item number five. For new buildings and additions, the applicant must show that the building is designed to accommodate solar power installation. This is meant by showing that the roof design can support solar panels and that the roof orientation, conduit, and electrical service will be incorporated so that the installation can be easily added either at the time of the construction or at any other point thereafter. Alternatively, the applicant may show the site is designed to accommodate solar with conduit to uh, be located to accommodate the ground system. Uh, the planning board may waive this requirement for green roofs, 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 or if the applicant provides uh, information to show that either building, uh, building mounted or ground mounted systems are impracticable uh, due to uh, site constraints and orientation. So there, uh, Councilor Klein. I think the word is roofs. I just want to say. Um, Not where I grew up. So <laughs> I'm uh, curious about this one because uh, I know that the building code is uh, state uh, mandates, and so I'm just wondering how this fits into um, that constraint. Um, how so around that constraint, I guess. So um, because this ordinance actually would only be triggered if. Um, a project is big enough or of a type that requires site plan review from the planning board. So it's not a standard, just a by right um, building project. That's one. And two, it's not stipulating exactly how something needs to be constructed. It's saying you need to show how it's going to be ready. You're not, it's not saying you have to use X, Y, and Z material. Um, so those two things, um, the building code and or the stretch code is moving in this direction anyway. The next iteration of the code won't have language like this, but they're working on it is my understanding. Um, so this really is only affects the projects that would 
trigger planning board, so it's not for every building that comes in. It's not for single family homes, it's probably not for two family homes. It's really for those projects that are a little bit bigger that trigger site plan. So presumably though it could be for single family homes. Depending on what happens with the building code in the future, but not under this. <coughs> Doesn't a building exceeding 2,000 square feet trigger it? Not any building, but any building other than a single family, right. So it so could be a multifamily residential that's over 2,000. And it could be an addition that's over. Could trigger an addition that's not for a single family home. Yeah. Yeah. To the point on orientation, um, there's not a lot of wiggle room other than alternate site. Uh, uh, for different mounting systems, right? It's not. Um, well, there's the. It's either show that your building is oriented and can and is structured in a way that can support a roof system, or that you have an area on the ground that could alternatively be used, um, unless you showed the planning board that neither of those is possible. Right. So so, it does dictate all things being equal, how and where the house would be sited on the lot, depending on access to solar, uh, you know, if it's surrounded by, uh, well, there's those damn trees again. So if it's surrounded by trees, <coughs> yet the, 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 the north corner of the lot has more solar exposure, they would be compelled to go move to that north corner of the lot, despite the fact that uh, other elements are more agreeable on the site? Um, potentially, um, again, for anything that might, that's over 2,000 square feet that's not a single family right. home. So we're not talking about just any, every single house. Right, no, no, I understand that. But, but, it, but whatever structure is going up there that, w that would trigger this, um, it, it does dictate, it, it, it does make, it compounds the challenges that are associated with any site, of course, obviously, that it would complicate matters, of course. And um, particularly the issue of orientation. Uh, I mean, but the workarounds that we offer are ground mounted systems, possibly, or is, is there an offset that can be allowed for? Um, well, the only in, within this language, the ground mounted system, or if you're doing a green roof in lieu of, you know, a PV array, those are specific that um, for. Um, offsetting or if it's just not feasible based on topography or the site itself it's just not conducive to that and I think you know um, we also have a significant tree ordinance so the board would you know if you have to cut down substantial you know s do a substantial cut right. on a parcel I think you could show the board that that you know you have to balance those Competing. good things <laughs> those yes. good green things so um, I think the idea is that um, project proponents should be thinking about all of this when they're designing. And so that it's not at the last minute you're coming to the table saying, oh, I forgot to think about orientation or where, you know, the exposure for my roof, but that it's built in. And, it, and that's precisely why um, the building codes are moving in that direction as well. Other questions? Councilor Klein? I guess I'm curious too about the um, construction community and what their thinking might be in relation to this, if that's been explored at all. Um, so my conduit to the construction community is the building commissioner. <laughs> um, and he actually put this language together because he thinks this is very doable and it's, um, and it um, meets goals and objectives for the city, and it's not particularly um, that that a lot of um, developers are thinking along these lines anyway because they need to meet stretch code requirements. Um, many developers are trying to achieve LEED certification, so there's all sorts of other things that are um, directing people to um, think about this anyway. That's what we're about. Yeah. 
uh, the building commissioner. I'm really having a hard time with that. Really now. It seems like, and I heard it again last week, with developers, that the city is becoming very, very difficult with permits. And I'm getting worried about this. Every time you're turning around, it's more permits or how you're going to do your property. I, I'm worried. Um, so the next iteration, the discussion of stretch code, and then of course state code now is exceeding uh, stretch code. Um, it's anticipated that this language would be incorporated in this anyway, and it would be. Not the very next one that's about to come out, oh. but it was on the table, it didn't get put in. Okay. I think there's still conversations about how that would happen. Um, I support this ordinance. I think it's just, it's one of those things like 20 years from now, we'll be happy we did it. You know, And I'm not, I don't know how many, it's not gonna apply to everyone's single family home. It's for, no. for special permits. I think it makes sense. I think we should vote in favor of it. Um, any other discussion on this? Okay, this one's not for referral. This is actually for first reading. So we're going to, we'll, uh, John, roll call, please. Councillor Dwight. <coughs> yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor LaBarge. Yeah. Councillor Murphy. No. Councillor Nash. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Char. Yes. Councillor Bidwell? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Okay, that passes in first reading. Uh, okay. Um, item 17.353. This is an ordinance eliminating the requirement for special permit when offsite parking spaces are required and lots away from educational facilities in which they occur. First reading. Is there a motion? Move approval. Second. Motion's made and seconded. So this is. Uh, uh, this is in order that the following section be modified as follows. <clears throat> section 350, subsection 8.7, I mean, chapter 350, subsection 8.7, uh, 8 item A, um, added the language except for educational uses. And then we read on required off street parking spaces shall be provided on the same lot as the principal use they are required to serve. When practical difficulties exist which prevent the, their establishment on the same lot, the planning board may grant a special permit to allow off-site parking spaces in a non-municipal lot. When measured along the pedestrian ways from the edge of the principal's uses parcel, the principal uses parcel, the closest point of that non-municipal lot must be one, 500 feet, or two, 1,000 feet from the premises to which they serve if a, the offsite parking shall, uh, will be shared by more than one land use, and B, the greater distance is justified because of pedestrian traffic patterns and the vitality of the adjacent land uses that would be part of the walk, and C, patrons or employees of the principal land are likely to utilize the provided offsite parking, or, and then, there is no or, the rest of that is struck. So we can drop that, I would strike that or as well. And uh, okay, discussion on this. Uh, Carolyn, actually, probably why don't you walk us through that. This is very simple. <laughs> oh, um, it's you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, um, this provision has been in the ordinance for I don't know how long, a long time, and we're not allowed to require special permits of educational uses which are exempt from um, zoning or from right. triggering special permits. So it's really just cleaning up the section that said colleges and educational uses need a special permit. So it's acknowledging the Dover Amendment. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That actually was simple. Uh, <laughs> Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Um, on, the, on the number 17 point 353, on my end it says 17 253. Well, it is item 17.353. So that's a typo. So, you have it, so those of you with the printed versions have it as 253. It's a typo. Um, those of us who have the digital version, it is in keeping with the, the other orders of the Send it back to the <laughs> <laughs> So Donald's moving that we refer it back. It's a typo. Until uh, you get the numbers right. <laughs> 
so that'll be noted on your 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 paper documents if you just make that little scrivener's adjustment that'd be great uh any other discussion on this item roll call please john uh councillor Klein. yes councillor the barge yes councillor murphy yes councillor nash yes councillor o'donnell yes councillor shara yes councillor bidwell yes councillor carney yes councillor dwight yes all right, an opportunity now. We have two more items, and they're for to load up that legislative matters. Uh, one. One other. We did one. Unless you want to do it again. This is a refer. Oh, I don't. Let's go. The next one is the refer. It's only a letter. Two of them. Yes, but then we have to um, suspend the rule. Is that last meeting? Yeah, we did that. We referred. Also, oh, it's just sitting here. I have a. I have an extra item. No, we took it out All right. of order earlier. We have we two referrals. Bump that up? Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yes, we did. What am I saying? <laughs> I just, now I'm reading it. Yeah, I'm sorry. What was that? What was that order? I can't remember what the hell that was. Motion Item 17.398. Just kidding. Uh, I'm beyond punchy at this point. <clears throat> this is an ordinance to amend the provision so that existing members of multiple member bodies <coughs> are not required to be approved again by the City Council prior to Community Preservation Committee. This is for referral to the City Services uh, Committee and the Committee. I mean, the, and the Committee on Just Legislative like Matters. Thus, so moved. Okay. Second. Second. Discussion on referral. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh my God! Um, hey. I noticed. It. I should note the Pulaski Day Parade comes up. I think. The second is a Monday. So it's got to be the ninth. It's October. Okay. okay. It's the inverted oh, six. That's why uh, legislative matters is going to have to right. Yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll have a question. <laughs> but uh, we're stuff. all invited to participate. Nice autumn walk. Does anybody know five. where the banner is? That's at 11 o'clock, right? It's at Jim Nash's house. Okay. Don't worry. All right. That's the extent of my updates. And uh, oh, what time did you say the parade is? I, see, I'm, I'm, I don't couldn't even oh. tell you the date, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, it's the but just, just to keep you in mind. It's October 9th. October 9th. That's at 11, right, Council? Usually, that's stepping off. <laughs> it's out of, at uh, nine. Out of the Honda lot. It's at 11. At 11. 11. Uh, there was a motion second. 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 All those in favor, please aye. say aye. 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 Thank you aye. all very much. So. Um, do we have to sign?